We're never done talking about feet. All right, it is official. We are live. I think is that actually is all of that preamble part of it, or is that just the preview? Uh, I hope not. <laughs> all right, quick, somebody go to the channel and see the live. <laughs> see what's uh, showing up there. Okay. I'm trying. YouTube slash Greg Troyan. That was not oh, the right wall. channel. YouTube search Greg Troyan. Okay. Oh, unless you have the microphone. I get to make jokes right now, but you cannot. See if this bad boy You're is working. Alive. Are you hearing anything? I see all of us. I hear me talking about searching for you on YouTube. Oh, yes. that, that means that means we're working. We are live. We are live, boys and girls. And there is audio and everything. And it immediately started with, we're never done talking about feet. <laughs> Good. <laughs> the important parts. It's the best way to open. Oh, shoot. I can, I can log in and harass the chat the whole time I'm here. You, <laughs> brilliant. you can. And Double I am... up on my shitty hot takes. And I, for some reason, can't find the live stream that is happening right now on my channel, for whatever reason. Well, why would you need to know about it? Right? <laughs> right. Are you going to get like a yeah. delay? Yeah, you're like the only person who doesn't I'm need to Greg, see it. I'm Greg. I'm Greg. Oh, I mean, I, w I would need it so I could see the chat. Uh, yeah. Seriously, why is it not showing up? I see my uh, live stream test. If this thing takes off, are we hoping to get Taylor as a guest one day? Is that are we thinking that's going to happen? Or? Uh, I, I don't see not. why not. We got Paul Stanley. She doesn't have anything better to do. Uh, she, yeah, I mean, like the Super Bowl's over. What else is she doing now? You know. I mean, this is I true. Wedding. All right, I've got it open in a private window, so. Ooh, lurking on yourself. Lurking on myself. Uh, is that actually the best way to do things? Probably not. Yeah, no, 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 no. Why am I so bad at this? So bad at streaming. I don't know. Why are you so bad at streaming? Probably because I've never done it before. That's that's probably the main reason why I'm so bad at streaming. That will do it. It's kind of hard to learn to do it while you're in the middle of doing it, too. Right. Well, the thing is, like, I did, like, enough research beforehand, and I thought, like, oh, I've got this. And then, like, you don't, because that's just how it works. Yeah, that should be the last step before you go on, is actually you don't. <laughs> streaming. That will. All right. Last step. Before you start his research. Last step before you start his research. All right. Well, hey, uh, I think I've got it. I've got the chat open in another window, and I've got the video muted in that window so I can respond to it. I've got my weird OBS camera set up in such a way where it should be showing me uh, talking. So I think I think we're actually good to start. I think, yeah. Nice. I mean, the stream is showing uh, the four of our screens with your cursor moving around. And then, That's fine. It's a little treat for the viewers. And then occasionally cutting to uh, just Greg scrolling through YouTube. All right. Well, right now it should be showing just um, just all of us. Just us. Just our thumbnails. Yes. All right. Well, that is that is uh, what we want. What we need. The mouse going around oh. will be a little treat for all the cats watching. Right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. So, hello, everyone. Welcome to the most professional live stream ever, a.k.a. most live streams. Most live streams I watch start with people saying, like, hey, can anybody actually hear us? Is the audio good? Hello? Can you hear us? Okay, cool. <laughs> So uh, this is, uh, the band has gotten back together, but not to make music. No, the band has gotten back together to make a podcast. 
For those uh, joining us, this is uh, basically a group of people uh, who are on a podcast called The Lipstick Panel, which started off as a, a cheap way to promote my band with my bassist Steve. Now the band doesn't exist anymore, but the people on the podcast are still friends, so it's like, hey, we'll just do that again. But we're doing it live, Bill Riley style, baby. And uh, we decided what band doesn't it, exist, but people do. <laughs> band doesn't exist, but people do. And we decided, you know what? Maybe instead of doing something that's like completely irrelevant that nobody cares about, uh, like bands from the seventies and nineties, what if we actually talked about an artist that was extremely relevant in the current zeitgeist? And uh, sorry, Mike, for saying that Kiss is irrelevant, but like in th- they haven't made an album in like twelve years. Like I, in terms of relevant on the charts today. It's hard to find someone more relevant than Taylor Swift, who is having the highest grossing tour in history, uh, continually getting number one albums, you know, scoring hits, scoring all kinds of awards. Arguably, you know, one of the most micro earthquakes causing micro earthquakes, like whether or not you like Taylor Swift, she is a literal force of nature at this point. And so uh, we small earthquakes and causing global warming. Right. So we decided, let's get the band back together to rank the Taylor Swift discography. So, but, you know, we're all like old adults now, so we'll only be able to do this once a month. But still, hey, we're going to do it. We're going to go through the entire catalog, and the way it works is just start with the first album. And so we're going to go around the panel before we get into our ranking of the songs, talk about our history with Taylor Swift, our general opinions on her as an artist, our general musical tastes, and our opinions on this album. Uh, we're starting a little bit late, so I'm going to try to move things along and not ramble too much. I'll explain the point ranking system later. Uh, Julia, give us your history with Taylor Swift and this album for all the folks who can see you at home. Oh boy, looking forward to kicking this one off. Okay, so I guess first I have to yank a giant skeleton out of my closet. Uh, Taylor Swift was someone I first learned about in middle school when this album had come out, and it grabbed a hold of every single 11-year-old girl in my life, myself included. Uh, not at first. Uh, when I first heard her, I was like, I cannot stand the sound of this bitch's voice. Uh, but after a while of kind of getting to know her music, I was like, you know what? I'm a kind of angsty child. And like some of these songs do do kind of tack on to this angst. And so I liked her. And then her second album came out and I loved it. I had it on constant repeat in the car couldn't go anywhere without it knew every song word by word and when i actually re-listened to it recently i was like man i still know every song on this album uh and same goes for speak now i was super into it um and then i hit a point with her where i was just like i feel like your songs are not maturing at the rate i wish they would kind of feels like we're just recycling the same kind of thing over and over again so by the time the singles for red came out I completely lost interest in her. I never even bought the album. Uh, And I kind of did a crazy 180 where I was just like, I don't understand this new sound. I don't like the new sound. And it only got worse from there. And I've hit a point now where I still feel that she has not progressed as a songwriter um, in a way that is meaningful or interesting to me. And I can't understand why anyone likes her even though i myself liked her at one point so you think i would be able to understand and like get back in the mind space of where i was when i was 11 but the truth is i'm not 11 anymore and i don't want songs that appeal to my teenage self i want songs for adults and she doesn't have those all right uh (laughs) coming in hot (laughs) um I've been thinking about this one for a while. This is going to be a fun year, everybody. <laughs> ah, that is, that is, uh, you know what? I'll go next to counteract some of that. Um, actually, I don't know how negative everyone else is going to get, so maybe I'll go last to try to salvage this. Uh, Mike, Pretty negative. <laughs> Mike, go ahead and go next. Uh, tell us your, like, general music tastes and your history with Taylor Swift, general opinions on her as an artist and this album. Sure. So, uh, general music taste, my favorite stuff is like 70s and 80s rock, hard rock, classic rock, glam rock, whatever. Um, By opinion, uh, my introduction to Taylor Swift, I want to say was uh, You Belong to Me. I mean, that song was huge. Uh, I've never seen the video everywhere. Um, Pretty sure that's the first Taylor Swift song I ever heard, like back when it was massive. 
Um, it's it's amazing to me thinking about this podcast and everything. Like I remember seeing because that was on the next album, I think. But this album, I like CDs were still a lot more relevant even back then, even though they were already like phasing out. But I remember seeing this CD everywhere, and by everywhere I mean like Best Buy and Walmart and Target. But like it, it was one of those things where you'd walk in and just see like fifty copies, which is a lot, you know, like back then and everything so i just remember seeing like her face on this album cover everywhere um general thoughts on taylor swift is she is a modern i like some of her songs i just laugh at all the, the hype the, the people who like really love her and the people who really hate her and i'm, I'm like all right i'm Gonna say that's just for um thoughts on this album. So before this podcast was not the first time I'd heard ninety percent of it and uh, music. I, I don't want. I guess I don't want to give too much away in terms of my song, but uh, it's solid. In terms of a Julia comment, um, give her credit because I was really uh, yeah Taylor, not Julia. A great beat, um. But I have other credit for her age. There is some very, I feel like, more mature songwriting than I would have expected. And then, of course, there's also moments where I'm like, this sounds like a kid wrote it. And I'm like, well, a, a kid did write it, so let's be fair. And that's what I have to say about that. Did Mike break up for everybody else or for just me? Uh, for me as well, but yours is the only case that matters because we're streaming via you. Okay. Um, yeah, that didn't, that didn't come gone, so great for us. At all, or? We, uh, uh, we just started glitching out and we lost about half of it. Oh, sorry. Uh, can I you change nothing? Um, can you repeat it and maybe like a, try to do like a summary way um, of what you just said? If you can like concise it, sure. try again. Um, Taylor Swift, my introduction to her was You Belong to Me uh, back when that song was really huge and massive. Um, I thought my general opinion of her is that she's famous. I know who she is. I, I don't love her or hate her. Um, and I thought this album was pretty good. This was the first time I had heard like the majority of it. And so I thought it was very nice songwriting. All right. Well, there we go. Uh, thank you, Mike. Victor, uh, I think we're probably going to get back to the negative with this. So what's your opinion on Taylor Swift, this album, general music tastes? Um, hello. Uh, my general music taste is like alt rock. Uh, I guess like eighties through two thousands. Um, I first heard of Taylor Swift probably along with Mike with the "You Belong with Me." That one's certainly the first one that comes to mind, and it was uh the one that Weird Al did <laughs> a parody of, so that helped. Um, I. I guess I'm mostly agnostic on Taylor Swift. Uh, I used to work at a grocery store, so sometimes her songs would come on and annoy me, but that didn't necessarily make her stand out on that playlist because <laughs> it was a grocery store playlist. Um, and it was mostly like I would hear about her doing something and I would either not care or be like, oh, that's dumb, but famous people are dumb. So whatever. <laughs> and... Uh, from I think the main thing that I took away from Taylor Swift as a cultural icon is everything that I've heard from her is either bad or fine. And it made me feel insane that I knew so many people who were obsessed with her. Um, and then Julia and I listened through the entire discography. And now I feel more that way um, because most of it's either fine or bad. And. I am just so confused. Uh, but this album for a teenager, I would say, is about as good as you could possibly expect. Um, I would I would go as far as to say that I was impressed with this album. Not that it's like some great masterwork, but the fact that it's m over half good, that's not nothing. All right, uh, now we're on to Steve. Uh, man, this is going to be a fun year. <laughs> Steve, what is your opinion on uh, Taylor Swift, this album, and your general music taste, which I'm sure will not confuse anybody at home? So uh, I grew up in a small town where the major unifying 
cultural features were country music, Catholicism, and being related to someone named Kirschbaum. I, uh, my family, were transplants, so we weren't related to anybody, and, and we practiced Protestantism, and generally we listened to rock music in our house. So by the time I was about 20-ish and this album came out, I was pretty firmly of the opinion that country music is bad music for dumb hicks. Um, there was no room in my heart to listen to Taylor Swift. I was uh, too young for them to market her to me as a pretty young girl that I could be creepily into, and I was too old to, you know, uh, view her as a peer or whatever. Uh, you know, it was the early 2000s. I was a young tech bro, so of course I'd grown up my entire life being told that the opinions of the opinions and artistic uh, contributions of women aren't particularly valuable. So of course I wasn't going to listen to a teenage girl playing country music. I was basically the exact opposite of the demographic for this album. So I don't remember the first song that I heard from her. Uh, it was probably one of her pop songs, actually, because uh, I just didn't listen to her. I had no interest in listening to her. I listened to the album in preparation of this episode and generally thought it was it was it was all right. There were a lot of a lot of things that I think they could have done much better. Considering you can you can hear them throwing money at this album, but not in a good way. Um, so all in all, uh, not a great time, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to the series of getting intimately acquainted with a bunch of music that I don't like. <laughs> I'm more open minded about things now. I I'm willing to acknowledge that there is some good country music. I have. Uh, more or less forgiven Catholicism, but it's still hands on sight for anybody named Kirschbaum. <laughs> uh, fair enough. Hey, man, uh, woke Pope, he's killing it uh, for the most part. So go, go woke Pope. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, I'm more of a young Pope guy. <laughs> I'm more a smoking Pope's guy. All right. So I am. Punk and metal. So I'm 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 last on this list. Uh, I guess I'm the only Taylor Swift fan on this panel, given that Jamie uh, was supposed to be with us, but is unable to due to the curse of daylight savings time and confusing people from out of the country. Um, so I, uh, when this album came out, my primary music taste was like '70s and '80s hard rock, and I was. This was, you know, I was 16 years old when this came out. I'm like a month younger than Taylor Swift. So it's interesting tracking like her uh, career trajectory to the chaos that is my life and just really enjoying like, oh, so if I was like a girl and had like rich parents, this is what would have happened. <laughs> um, but regardless, uh, I was too busy listening to, like, Rat and Quiet Riot to listen to the Taylor Swift debut album, and my sister had it. And I heard teardrops on my guitar, and I'm like, man, this is chick music. I'm going to go listen to Round and Round. And so that's what I was doing at the time. And was just not impressed by this album at all, because I thought it's like, whatever, it's chick music. And I just completely wrote it off. And that's not to say that I didn't like different kinds of music, but I was a 16-year-old boy listening to Rat and Quiet Riot. This was not going to work for me. Uh, but that said, the next album, when I saw the You Belong With Me music video, I was like, that is an incredible song, and I instantly became a fan and uh, you know, enjoyed everything after that point up until Reputation. And then I completely wrote off that album and thought it was trash and sort of had given up on her. Um... Lover came out, and it was sort of a return to form, and I liked it a little bit better, but wasn't fully back in, liked a couple singles. But then, um, everything after Lover, Folklore, uh, Evermore, and Midnight's, I've been, I've been all in, and I can say, like, I am a fan, I like the entire catalog, um, you know, I had, like, a period where I fell off, and wasn't sure whether or not I respected the total artistry, and just like, oh, wrote her off, just like, oh, whatever, just another pop musician, but... Really going through her catalog, I'm not an expert in it. Uh, I'm not sure. Like, I couldn't tell you which song is about which boyfriend necessarily. But I, I, I do enjoy her music. I do enjoy her songwriting. I do respect her as an artist, which I'm probably the only person on this panel who does. Maybe Mike also does because he's less harsh than everybody else. But yeah, I uh, this album was my least listened to before this podcast, and now it is my most listened to because of listening to it once a day in preparation for this podcast. So I'm now intimately familiar with an album that I completely wrote off and 
I like it. Overall, I like it. Not her best work, but I enjoy this album for what it is. And so I'm the only face on this panel full of heels with Mike Walsh being the, the neutral force. Yeah, and I just want to say I, I already caught myself making uh, an old man mistake that I was like totally trying to not make on this podcast. And I, I called the song You Belong to Me, even though it's You Belong With Me. And um, so, yeah, I, I I caught myself. I'm I'm the old guy who, you you belong to me, that, that, that <laughs> awesome Casey Musgrave song. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> also, Greg, I will say, you're going to have a friend in me this episode because I do like this album. I think a lot of it is nostalgia related, maybe, for some of the songs that I, I'm like, I listen to them now. I'm like, well, this song's not that good, but I like it still. It reminds me of my youth. Being a uh, well. But I cannot wait to get to speak now, and I can't wait to get to whatever the fearless. Fearless is my favorite, so yeah, just well, coming out announcing that. Well, I can't wait to be a bastion of sunshine and joy on every album, and desperately try to maintain my optimism <laughs> against uh, everyone once we get to stuff like Reputation, which. I will rag on the first half, probably, because uh, side two, way better. All right. So for this ranking, uh, everyone uh, votes on the songs. Uh, we decided to rank 15 songs on this album. We included the bonus tracks, but not the pop version of Teardrops on my guitar, which, Mike, I appreciate your ranking, but we don't need to talk about two different versions of the song. Just like, all right, this one has shitty drums behind it. Got it. <laughs> but uh, best the so- same song, but really bad. Right. Which you can argue whether or not that song is really bad when we get to it. But uh, best song on the album, we have 15 songs, would have gotten 15 points. Worst song on the album, uh, you know, you would get, uh, you vote, it uh, gets one point. And so we add up the points of the different panelists and see where things stack up. And so the song that got the least amount of points from the panelists across the board, which uh, we don't have Jamie here, but I will read his notes. We have Invisible coming in at the bottom. Uh, Julia, you ranked this second from the bottom. What are your thoughts on Invisible with this powerful, powerful teenage girl energy? Okay, again, here comes the skeleton out of my closet. When I was 11, I loved this song. I was like, oh, this is so me. I'm that girl that nobody sees. Nobody gets me. And I could barely listen to it now. I was like, this this one's like physically hurting me. It was an assault on the senses. It was too much. Um, the uh, And like, seriously, the only thing that didn't put it in the bottom spot for me was the, that part of me that was like, your 11-year-old self wouldn't let you say this was the worst song on the album. And so that's why it's in my number 14 and not my number 15. But good God, this one is nails on a chalkboard for me in, in the sense of how embarrassing it is. Uh, yeah, um, I'm going to read Jamie's comment, Nat, since he's still not here. Jamie says, another teardrops on my guitar that isn't as good. It ha- It's good, all the ingredients, but the album has reached saturation point here. Um, Mike, you also ranked this uh, second from the bottom. What's your thoughts on Invisible? I mean, I, I don't really have any, so I'm going to just, uh, you know, in- inject like, it's Invisible. Uh, terrible joke right now. Um. <laughs> I just remember, like, eh, it's. I mean, it, it's. I don't hate it. I, I I like it. I guess probably more than Julia. If she's calling it cringy or whatever. But like, I just didn't really need it. Um, I mean, if out of fifteen songs, um, I could cut it. You know, I mean, it, I yeah, it's just it's just okay. I, eh, yeah, that's all, that's all I got for you. Uh, you know, or, uh, you could cut which it. Isn't very flattering. So I guess that's what I guess that's why it's bottom. You know. Didn't they? This is a. This was one of the bonus tracks, wasn't this, it? Yeah, this was one of the bonus tracks. Yeah, so Mike, you're right. They did cut it. Yeah, and well, and, and I don't know of those bonus tracks were all were the were any of those newer? Like, oh, like let me write a new song really quick and add it to the reissue. I, I, that I don't know. I'm so not Swifty, I guess. Fine. Um, yeah, I mean, this one was ranked second from the bottom by everybody except for myself and Jamie. So, uh, Victor, uh, continue with the chorus of second from the bottom. Uh, it is, like, the j- the joke is there that it's invisible because it just, like, I was reading my notes and I couldn't remember anything about the song. And the first note in my notes was that, uh, I, I did my notes on the third listen of the album that I did. 
And the first line that I had about it was that it didn't ring a single bell. <laughs> so <laughs> this was uh, not not her finest. Uh, yeah, I said that I maybe liked a piano part at the beginning, but I couldn't. Nothing. I couldn't. I couldn't tell you what it sounded like. <laughs> it. Yeah. No. No to this one. Uh, very wise to cut it. All right, uh, Steve. Also second from the bottom. Rip into it. Go ahead. I, I mean, I'll 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 try to be a little bit nice. I basically Jamie summarized my exact thoughts on this. Is this is a second tier teardrops on my guitar, and it is you know utterly unnecessary. My main difference between him is I was just meaner about it in my notes. I used the word incel. He didn't. <sighs> okay, so. <laughs> It is it is now my job to be the face of this podcast against all the heels, and I rank this at the bottom, so lower than everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's um, what happens when you when you structure your so- show to start with the song that everybody collectively liked the least. This is true. I mean, but it doesn't make sense to start with the best one first. We'll start in the middle, then do the the bad ones. Um. I think, you know, this one, I really, I understand the sentiment and I feel the sincerity with the um, number of interviews Taylor has said where she felt like an awkward kid and didn't fit in. I do think she's actually being sincere about that. And the number of boys she had a crush on that completely ignored her and then turned out to be like, you know, total pieces of garbage. Like, ah, man, that is super authentic to like a 12 year old girl. And since some of these songs were written when she was like 12 years old, you know, 13, 14, 15, I feel the authenticity of the piece. But by that same token, it's, I think the, uh, the vocal, I think her vocal ability isn't as strong on this album. And she eventually becomes a great singer, but that's more just like, okay, you know, she was, she was 16. She was fine herself. I think the, Vocal strength wasn't quite there yet, and I think just it's there were other songs that were catchier, more pleasing. I have never been a 12-year-old girl, and so even though I can understand where she's coming from, it just didn't resonate with me as much, but I felt the sincerity of it, and so I still I still like it. I don't dislike anything on this album, but it is, it is the one I like the least. I think her fake country accent gets away from her on this one. And I don't dislike the fake country accent. Okay, I'll back her on that one. I think it rules. <laughs> She's like, I'm a country artist. I'm going to have the fucking accent. <laughs> I, I like that. Good. She should have stuck to it. I'm honestly pissed that she dropped it. It was too sincere. The, the problem was this was, this was the authentic track and then nobody liked it. Yeah, I mean, then for good reason. Yeah, I think, I do think, yeah, you're you're right to say the vocal performance gets away from her on this one. It definitely does. I, I will say I do feel um, a lot of sincerity from this album, which is something that I felt less and less as the uh, discography goes on. This this album does feel very genuine in a way that um, is, only a twelve year old girl can muster. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like yeah, a uniquely Honestly, teenager thing to be able to do. Yeah, on the country accent note, um, I always just assumed for the last. 20-ish years that Taylor Swift was Southern, and then reading up on it, like, for this podcast, I'm like, oh, she's from Pennsylvania? Okay, so... Okay, did not know <laughs> that. But, but, I mean, I have, like, relatives from Central Illinois, which isn't even Southern Illinois, and it's a Northern state, and they have country accents, and they're not faking it, so I don't know. I think uh, you just yeah, go I'm two from, hours I'm out from of Eastern Andy Washington. We all have Southern accents, accents too. <laughs> yeah. Because so. Taylor Swift's actual native accent is um that uh two packs a day rasp you get from inhaling the coal fumes in the mines. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> the uh, the West Virginian accent. With me. Taylor Swift's natural yeah. singing voice just sounds like Tom Waits, and she just does her best to fake the sound. <laughs> I was just oh, that was cool. I was gonna say Tom Waits. <laughs> No, oh, because I want her to have that like working class Springsteen feel, you know. I want that's what I want from her. It's the reason for the teardrops on my guitar. I'm looking forward to when we eventually discuss "Mean," which is a song written about how she got upset about people criticizing her singing voice. Um, 
I'm I'm excited for when we get to that one. But I do think, uh, no. you know, I I I I do. Uh, which also, I think that song is sincere as all hell. That song is like, I I got into a debate with a friend of mine whether or not Taylor Swift writes her own songs, and um, my argument was, she uses similar chord progressions. Uh, similar melodies, similar lyrical themes across her entire discography. And despite working with different collaborators, you can recognize which patterns are clearly hers because otherwise all these different people would have to memorize all those different patterns. She's also released videos of her working on songs. So she would have to be faking that, faking her understanding of how the songwriting process works, getting hundreds of people to sign NDAs and lie about her songwriting process, or she just writes songs you don't like. And he refused to believe yeah, that. I mean, actually, <laughs> uh, she didn't uh, write all of the songs on this album. And you can actually tell which ones aren't hers because they go into an even more cliche country sort of vibe that just isn't what Taylor writes. Like, I, I it's very interesting to me because I'm like, for, for all the reasons I don't like her on this album, I'm like, you really can't tell that she she does have a distinct perspective and her songs are better than the ones that other people took more of the writing reins for because then it's just kind of like i wrote this song thinking it's what a 12 year old girl wants to write instead of from the 12 year old girl uh speaking of uh outside writers and um less of taylor's personality in the song next up on the list we've got a perfectly good heart which anyone who uh has been to a nashville uh writers round knows exactly what kind of song this is. This is pure, like, Nashville professional songwriting. I know Taylor is credited on this, and I do believe that on all the songs where she has a co-writing credit, I do think she's involved. I don't think it's that they just stuck her name on it. I do think she was involved in the process, but that doesn't necessarily mean she was the driving force behind the song. This song, I absolutely do not think she was the driving force behind the song. But that said... I do like this one. I ranked this one the highest of the bunch. Actually, Jamie and I put it in the same spot. We both gave it eight points. Look, I've got nostalgia for those, like, kind of generic country pop songs you hear at Writer's Rounds in Nashville. Like, I like that kind of music. I know it's cringe. I know basically everybody else doesn't like that, but I I, I dig it. I, I like it. I don't know. It just gives me warm, fuzzy memories of, like, you know, going to the Bluebird and going to Cafe Coco and just hearing the, you know, the singer songwriters with their kind of generic country songs. Like, I, I dig it. I dig it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I like it. Um, hashtag sorry, not sorry. Uh, Julia, uh, as you know, Steve, you ranked this the lowest. Uh, also, a uh, fellow Nashville musician, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I, I put this right at the bottom. I mean, pretty much for all the reasons that Greg said, like, all I wrote down for this one is it is utterly dispensable. It is just the most bland and generic song, and I don't have nostalgia goggles for those generic bad pop country songs that you hear at uh, open mic nights. Um, you know, I like I like to go into open mic nights. Uh, they're a, they're a fun thing to do, and it's fun to get out there and meet other musicians and swap music with them. But just like I never cared for uh, the the generic pop country stuff. I had a terrible time the one time I went to the the Bluebird open mic. Uh, it is the second worst open mic in the world. Um, Cafe Coco was fun though because it allowed weirdos. Uh, that's 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 the big thing. It's like uh, hearing a couple of those generic country songs is fine, just as long as you get to hear some weirdos too. And this is you know this is the generic pop country song nestled in a munch among a bunch of other slightly less generic pop country songs you just it doesn't need to be i mean that's fair i mean in fairness i liked uh both the generic country songs and the weirdos as evidenced by me buying your cd at an open mic so you know room to like both I but distinctly i distinctly in the weirdo category yes <laughs> yes you were distinctly in the weirdo category but like hey man it's a it's a great album uh let's see who is next um Jamie said, this is a great song. That is his entire notes. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, Julia, you gave this three points. So what's your opinion on A Perfectly Good Heart? This is a bad song. That's all. Okay. Uh, Victor, you are the second highest after myself and Jamie. So counter, uh, counter Julia's point. Uh, yeah, counter to Julia's point. Uh. I think it, 
I find it amusing because the the chorus line is like, why would you want to break a perfectly good heart? Which whatever level of cleverness that is, is completely undone in the bridge where she says it's not unbroken anymore, <laughs> <laughs> which is such a hilarious thing to write. It's like so it's so purposefully obtuse that I thought I wrote it. <laughs> um but otherwise yeah as pretty much everybody else said it is a bit generic uh which put it uh just below the midpoint of my rank and uh mike you gave it five points what's your thoughts on this piece yeah i mean i guess i love this album um because uh i did put it in my you know lower tier but uh, i thought it was a nice song I actually kind of thought maybe I was uh, being a little hard on it um, by ranking it as low as I did, and it sounds like uh, a lot of people ranked it lower. But uh, I think it's a nice song. I guess I'm with you. Like to me, it's just a pleasant countryish song. Um, yeah, I actually genuinely thought uh, Julia loved this song in the in the group chat. She's like, "Oh yeah, perfectly good heart." I'm like, "Oh, she's gonna be mad because I ranked it so low." Turns <laughs> nope. out I ranked it high. Like, <laughs> who knows what's going on? Like, it was the opposite. I yeah, I get it, it now, but I, I didn't know I uh, I did not know I was coming into this podcast as like maybe oh biggest Taylor Swift fan of the group. This is wild to me. It, it's uh, you and me, man, against no, the world. Yeah. yeah. I didn't I didn't know I didn't know that was going to be my position but here we are. Speaking of fighting the world, next up on the list is A Place in This World. Uh Julia ranked this as the worst song on the album, so did Victor. Uh and uh Steve ranked it as the best. So, I don't even know. What? <laughs> yeah. Oh my, Steve, why? I I, I Steve, Let's I originally had it as my number 1. So I get it, man. And Mike ranked it at, uh, no. gave it 13 points. I gave it two points. Jamie gave it three. Uh, so there's some wild disagreement here. Um, you know what? I want to hear Julia first and then Steve directly after that. Let's, uh, actually, no, Julia, Victor, <laughs> then Steve. I want to hear the two lowest votes and then Steve. Oh my God. I don't even know what to say. I'm in shock right now. I'm, um, so I owned this album and knew every song. And when we re-listened to it, I was like, Victor, I don't think I've ever heard this song before. And even now I'm like, I can't remember what it sounds like. I don't remember the words. It's just dull, forgettable. There's nothing here. Um, she was not cooking. I don't even think she was in the kitchen. <laughs> Damn. Um, I, I, I actually do remember how this song goes. Um, I think it's not a like an unempathetic point of like reference for what a song could be about. I just don't think it's very interesting. Um, it has like the one kind of cool country chord at the end of the chorus, and that's like the only thing that really stood out to me. Uh, and mostly the song is just like this is another one that a teenager would write. Uh, but not, not in a very interesting way. And it is kind of funny that it ended up as last. Maybe it's because I thought it was that lame. Because <laughs> I can actually remember it better than Invisible. So Steve, why is this the best song on the album? So a big part of trying to find any sense of enjoyment on this album is really trying to listen past um, Nathan Chapman's terrible, terrible choices for, you know, Taylor Swift is a pretty, pretty talented for her age uh, songwriter. And then her dad threw a whole bunch of money at Nathan Chapman to make a pop country album. And he tried his hardest and did a lot of really terrible things. So like, by this point in the album, I'm actively trying to disregard slide guitar, which is an instrument that just generally gets on my nerves, and the banjo, which is an instrument that does not excite me. Um, and also ignoring all the super weird processing he was doing on her voice that made it so that so many prominent words just don't sound like what she said. So I kind of cracked up a little when I got to the bridge of this one, and she sings, maybe I'm just a girl on a mission, but I'm ready to blah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Genius.com tells me that word is fly, but that is 
not what she ended up singing. So I found that amusing. But really, uh, this one, it's it's a catchy enough melody. It's got a better harmony work than most re- the rest of the album, which is all pretty generic harmony work. And I love falsetto. Uh, falsetto is one of my favorite vocal techniques. So anything that uses that gets a couple bonus points. Uh, Nathan Chapman was cooking on the bass, though, <laughs> on this track. He was sizzling. Sizzling the bass. So um, I'll read Jamie's comments next. He says, Opens up like a hard day's night. I'll leave the comparison there. Cool tune, nice energetic chorus, desp- despite still being quite slow. Uh, Mike, you thought the song, uh, thought pretty highly of it. You gave it 13 points out of a possible 15. What's your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I mean... Um... Great song, hot take. This is a better song than a hard day's night. Um, I'm, that is I'm the hottest it. take I've ever heard about. <laughs> I'm I, I, just want, I just wanted to make you mad. No, um, all right, all right. no, I really, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just wanted to make you mad. Uh, it hard worked. Day's night is my favorite. Um, I, yeah, I, I thought it was a very nice melody. Uh, I, I liked the hook. Um, it's a little more. Uh, up tempo than like a full on one of the full on ballad. I just saw the album was maybe a little ballad heavy for me listening to it over 15 years later as a almost 40 year old man. I uh, just didn't really need a bunch of young girl ballads. Not that they aren't good, but I didn't need five of them or however many. Um, I thought this one was a little more like, oh yeah, place in this world. Nice. I Yeah, I think it's a really nice song. I had it I did it as number one in my preliminary ranking, like as 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 they were all happening. So that was what's like, what is it, song four or five or something on the album? That one went to number one and then uh, kind of shifted from there. But it's up there. It's up there. All right. So uh, I ranked this um, second from the bottom. So one above Invisible. Um, I think like, you know, at the end of the day, I will pretend often to be like a guy who's real into deep lyrics. But it's like, man, like, how are the hooks? Uh, hooks on this one just aren't as great as other songs. I think that... Because um, Taylor didn't really have as much of, of like a strong low register at this point, her vocals can just come off as a little bit grating when she gets you know really high because there's just not as much uh, power and emphasis there, which she does eventually get. And I do give like some points back to the vocals for like lack in technique when there's so much sincerity, you know, coming from a guy who is a, a trash singer, like I am not a good singer. Um, like I'm going to be very lenient on vocal technique when it comes to a song. But I think this one, you know, I think the opening line to the song is, I don't know what I want. And that seems like a very un lyric. Taylor seems like she knows exactly what she wants, which is, no, I want to be like a dominant pop super superstar and write six songs. So, but at the same time, even though I think she does know what she wants, there is that authentic, like, teenage girl insecurity of like, well, is that really what I want, though? And so, again, I think it's, um, I think it's authentic. I think it's sincere. I just don't like it as much as some of the other catchier songs. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, mega pop star, super billionaire Taylor Swift knows what she wants. Keep in mind, this is, like, debut album Taylor Swift. Still didn't quite knew what she wanted at that point in life. Yeah, but... Which is why her dad threw (laughs) threw a bunch of money at getting this album made, I'm sure. Right, but in fairness, she also, she did hustle really hard. She released a whole bunch of demos before this album, I think starting like 2002, and like delivered them to everyone on Music Row. And I guess that's a thing in Nashville. Like, do you have one of those old Taylor Swift demos? A lot of the old record label guys have those. And she, you know, got turned down a lot. But one of the things that also she gets a lot of credit for is that she did a lot of promo for this album. A lot of uh, country acts, I guess, will promote for like two or three months. She promoted this album for like 18 months hard, going to like every, you know, DJ, country DJ in the country, you know, shaking hands, you know, trying to get her stuff out there. So and playing like a bunch of small venues. So she she did, you know, obviously she had the advantage of like, the family supporting her and the money behind it. But in fairness, like she also did hustle. So like I respect the hustle. I understand she had the advantages that none of us ever had, but at the same time, I don't think it's not her success is completely without merit either. And it's only because of money. I think it's money and hard work 
and talent. And if she didn't have the money, would she be as successful? Almost guaranteed not. But I do think that it doesn't mean her success is completely unwarranted either. I mean, the the yeah, fact like, that she was... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, oh no, you go first. I was going to say, the fact that, obviously, the fact that she was hustling that hard, like, passing out demos that were all rejected until her dad bought a 3% stake in Big Machine Records or whatever it was, uh, sort of, just really goes to show, uh, with hard work and talent and a, a substantial, substantial amount of money, you can do anything. But again, yeah, I, I mean, just because I, someone gets a, rejected a lot doesn't mean that it's not eventually good. Like, I think this album is good. You look at Bad Out of Hell, that got rejected by a bunch of record labels. So Kiss got rejected by record labels and such before, you know, Bill Coin got them a deal. So it's not a matter I of... I wish they would have kept that rejected. What? I said I wish they would have kept that up. <laughs> the rejection part. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be uh, as harsh on just the oh, she's only successful because she has money. I think there's a little bit more to it than that, because I think there's plenty of artists who have money thrown at them and they don't have longevity. The fact that she has longevity, I think, says something. You know, it, and Mike can relate to this as a Kiss fan, where people are like, oh, Kiss are only successful because of their gimmick. A gimmick only takes you so far. Daddy's money only, you know, it can get your record deal, but it can't get people to buy your record. Like, you actually have to have some substance behind it. And even if money can push one album, to have as many successful albums as she has with musical style changes and to have the highest grossing concert tour ever, it can't just be only money. It's a factor, but it's not the only factor. Just like how Kiss's success is based not only around their theatrics, but also like their the music to back it up. In my opinion, hashtag Hot Tate Troyan. Yeah, I'll, I'll mean, support that in terms of Taylor Swift. Like, I get I get why people are like, oh wow, she just had someone to throw money at her. Like, yeah, that's that's cool. I wish you know more. I wish I had that or whatever. But like, um, but yeah, I think there's enough there. I mean, enough of a career to say that there's something there because. You could record an hour of someone like burping and farting and like throw a billion dollars into promoting it. And like you could maybe get that one album of burping and farting to number one and get on every late night talk show. Like I burped and farted. Ha ha ha. And like it'll be huge for like a couple weeks or whatever. But you're not going to build a 20 career, 20 year career on that. So there is something to Taylor Swift. I can't believe I'm like in love with Taylor Swift now. Like, like <laughs> what have you done to me? Like, what have you done to me? You're such a hardcore Swifty. I am. I'm like a hardcore day. Swifty. I'm like, no, I don't care. I don't care if her daddy's rich. Like, well, she deserves it. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, I think, okay, well, I'll say this on, on it, where I definitely agree that she had something specific, which I do think is her image. And that is the thing that she is able to sell. That's actually where I think her brilliance is, is in her marketing. She really, really knows how she is perceived and how to use that to her benefit, which I don't blame her for. What bothers me is, I mean, yeah, obviously we've all talked about how it's like, you know, the the money definitely paved the way. O other people don't have the money to stop, you know, everything they're doing and travel all over the place and physically hand their CDs to people. Um, so I feel like just because she was doing that is like not that other people wouldn't have also loved to do the same thing. That also comes down to the money. The record deal came down to money. All of it comes down to money. But she does have like her. I don't know. I, I think what bothers me is then what they're really trying to sell you on isn't really the songs. It's that she's the girl next door. But she's not the girl next door. She's a rich girl. Like, <laughs> I don't know. It's like I get that that's just part of the music industry, and it's kind of one of those things where it's like, you know, it. it, it there was a point I was trying to make that I, I think I get. I think I get what you're saying. I I get it, and it's I. There's a sort of um sense of just like a populism that doesn't feel good about it. We're just like, oh, of course, the rich girl gets to be really successful, but. By that same token, there, you know, I grew up in a neighborhood where there was like really poor people and really rich people that went to like the same good public school. There were like the the country hicks, there were, and there was like, you know, the people who's, you know, maybe even had more money than Taylor Swift. And like their house had like a personal movie theater. And I were like, whoa, you guys have a movie theater in your house. And it was, that was wild for me as a kid, the, the wealth gap. Um, 
but they could still be like they were still friends i still like you know played in bands with those people and i didn't think any less of them trying to pursue their art so with with taylor i you know it's the you know there's the unfair advantage of you know you know the rich kids having the head start at the uh you know at the beginning of the race but i don't think it makes any artistic statement they make completely invalid like lenny kravitz you know, was a rich kid, and people don't have the same level of scrutiny from him when, like, what? His mom was, like, a, you know, big-time television producer. Um, so I think there's room to, you know, allow people from different backgrounds to be successful. Bruce Springsteen, dirt poor, successful. Taylor Swift, um, you know, rich, successful. I'm not trying to simp for rich people because there are a lot of people who are rich who just only coasted on the fact that they had money and don't actually contribute anything, like Elon Musk. Oh, right. But, so it, it's. I but, remember the point I was trying to make. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. No, I, go ahead. It, it goes along with what you're saying. Because I was like, she obviously genuinely likes what she does. Which, you know, some of these rich people just do it out of a sense of entitlement. But I definitely do think that she genuinely likes being a songwriter. I think that's why she handed her CD to everyone. Was like, she wanted to be famous. She wanted to be a songwriter. It's not like she's just like, I want... To make a lot of money yet later she's like that sorry all shade all tea i mean i i i you know we'll we'll get to that when we get to that i think we've sort of beaten the subject into the ground at this point we're only three songs yeah. into the ranking and steve has to go in an hour so oh boy um, so anyway, uh, Mike, unfortunately, you are not a real Taylor Swift fan, according to this ranking, because Nutst Up is cold as you. The first track five in this podcast. Um, so Mike, not being a, a true Swifty yet at this point, doesn't know that track fives are considered like big highlights of every Taylor Swift album. They're usually a big overall emotional ballad, and they're usually Taylor's favorite song from the album or one of her favorites. And usually has, like, you know, what she considers the deepest lyrics on the album. And, Mike, you ranked the track five on this album in dead last. Uh, what's your thoughts on Cold As You, Mike? Um, m- much like Invisible was Invisible, I am just cold for Cold As You. Um, again, it was... Uh, part of it is... Um, I think I cut out way in the beginning when I said that, like, my background is, like, I love 70s and 80s hard rock music. I'm coming from a little bit more of a, I like a little things more up-tempo generally, a little more melodic and exciting. Um, so, you know, with an album with a ton of, like, young girl ballads, I'm not shitting on them. They're well-crafted, but, you know, I'm I'm not going to be as drawn to it in 2024 as a 40-year-old. Um, but it was fine. I don't, I didn't dislike it. I those bottom few I had kind of shifted a little bit. So invisible cold as you, I'm trying to remember which other one. Um, I kind of listened back and forth. I'm like, Oh, well, I like this part, but then I like this other part on this other one. So it, it's not absolutely a guaranteed at the bottom for me, but it's down there for those reasons. Nothing personal. All right. Well, next up on the, in the ranking in terms of a uh, point value, Victor gave it five points. So the track five got five points from Victor. So, what do you think of "Cold as You"? Um, I it was the first one in um, track listing that I wrote as not ringing any bells when I listened to it again. Um, so that's not a good start. Uh, the chorus I remember being all right. Um, and it's very melodramatic, so at least like it stands out for that. Like she dies in the song, and no, <laughs> pretty wild. <laughs> Um, she dies i missed that <laughs> yeah man <laughs> yeah, i uh, totally missed that too what in the i think she the, was saying that nobody the, would care if i died is what she was saying which is yeah wow. so she didn't actually die but she, also that you is wouldn't tell anyone you wouldn't tell nobody if i died for you died for you okay wait <laughs> <laughs> which is it's pretty wild this also starts um one of my my favorite bits from especially the early taylor swift career which is um whoever the the male subject of the song that's who i imagine is doing the backing vocal. so that that bit starts now 
<laughs> the guy who wouldn't tell a soul if Taylor Swift died for him was doing the backing vocal song. Let's see, Jamie's comments. A more melancholy teardrops for me has all the same brilliant ingredients. And like the rest of the album, it has that impeccable country pop production. Amazing arrangement with all of the lead elements. Uh, well, that is uh, Jamie's favorable position towards it. Uh, let's see, who is next highest? Um, Steve, you're next highest. To me, this is a, a pretty middling track overall. Uh, I ranked it pretty much right in the middle. Uh, I wrote some snarky things in my notes because I'm Canadian and I just had a cold when I was doing my ranking. So I was like, oh, she's appropriating my culture and my disease. Um, but anyway, uh, I gave it four out of ten points because that's how many chords this song uses. Uh, it's nothing really to say about it. Uh, yeah, I gave it. Uh... <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I've never heard it described as Canadians as having a cold culture. Uh, so I like it. I like it. <laughs> We have a culture of cold. So I gave it nine points. It didn't rank uh, so higher in my ranking, not quite uh, at the very tippy top, but higher up there. I uh, I like it. I think it's um, look, I like I like Jim Steinman. So just like really overwrought melodramatic piano ballads, I am fine with, and I can tell how much she likes the song. Um. I think there was like an interview where she was talking about the song and said that, you know, she liked how, you know, a song called Code As You had like sick burns in it. And I'm just like, I, I like this energy. I, I dig this. I respect this. It's, um you know, in terms of the overall track fives, it's probably one of the weaker ones, but I don't know. I dig it. And uh, I'm excited that we got to our first track five on this series. Uh, Julia, you ranked this the highest, 11 points. Uh, does this track five resonate with you? Yes, I'm an emo kid, always was, always will be, and this is her most emo song, at least on this album. Uh, I love this one, and I love the feeling that she puts into her performance in this one. I can tell that she she's like, oh, she's feeling every second of this song, and it helps me feel every second of this song. Yeah, so um, ranked low on this uh, rank, and I'm sure the Swifties will be upset about that if they end up actually finding this podcast ever. <laughs> I'm here for you, Swifties. I got you. <laughs> this time. I feel like uh, Julia is the uh, Batman villain two-face of this panel, where she's like, ah, oh, Taylor Swift, I hate her, she's terrible, but I love this song so much. I hate her. I sing every word to this song. I feel it just as hard, bitch. Okay. <laughs> 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 all right nuts up on the list uh i don't know how many of these we'll get to before steve has to leave but uh, we've got i heart question mark nuts on the list um steve you ranked it uh actually no jamie ranked this at the bottom but while i get to jamie's comments steve why don't you talk about this one? Oh, um so of the bonus tracks i ranked this one the highest mostly for nature of like as a bonus track it's pretty dispensable but um i appreciate that they brought anybody but nady boy in to do vocals uh it's just by this point in the album i am so tired of his voice fair so, enough it's a nice it's a nice reprieve uh jamie ranked it gave it one point said there's a reason this wasn't on the album properly so obviously he was a big fan um victor you put this in second place giving it 14 points uh what <laughs> I uh so you're not gonna like this. I actually used your uh your metric, which is going with just the songwriting over the actual production, because I do think the production lacks a certain pop, and maybe that's because they didn't keep doing drafts after they decided it wasn't gonna be on the album. Well, it lacks a certain but pop because like, it's country. Yeah, that too. But um Yeah, there's there's no there's no pop in country. Um <laughs> it, it, <laughs> I like that it's like a, I mean, the the album already has like a very sassy country song on it. So I can understand why you wouldn't have gone with this one. But I, I did like that it was a a sassy country song I had never heard. Um, And I think at this point, Taylor doesn't literally have the vocal chops to actually pull this off. 
but I thought as a song it was pretty good and like maybe a like more cohesive it leveled up talent could make something um and it's uh, the best song I've ever heard uh, that's and I love Taylor Swift there you go uh throwing a bone for the Swifties um let's see I ranked it um I gave it seven points I it's a pleasant pop song. I like pleasant pop songs. Um, I don't think this is one of the the deeper songs uh, lyrically, one of the more interesting songs lyrically. But it's like it's bouncy and it's catchy. I like bouncy and catchy. That's really all I've got to say about it. Um, Julia and Mike both gave this nine points. So uh, Mike, why don't you go next, and then we'll close out with Julia on this track. Yeah. So I mean, I don't even know if I gave this one. And a, a, the most fair uh, listen or whatever, because I had been listening to the album as it is on Spotify for like weeks, and then this one isn't with the album on Spotify. Um, so finally, I'm like, oh yeah, I gotta get around to that other song. So it was the last one I had listened to. Uh, listened to it a lot less than any of the others. And at first, I'm like, eh, this album was good, but I'm kind of sick of listening to Taylor Swift now. Like, I don't even know if I like this song that much. And then by the end of it, I'm like, yeah, like you said, it's bouncy, it's catchy. I'm like, that's actually a, a pretty good song. And so it ended up kind of somewhere in the middle for me. I do think it's good. Um, but yeah, like I said, I probably listened to the other ones, I don't know, over 10 times. I think I listened to this one like twice. And Julia, how about you? How do you feel about I Heart? Question um, mark. I hadn't heard this one before. And so when we listened to it, I was like, well, hello. I, yeah, I kind of agree with you, Greg. I was like, it's like bouncy, it's catchy. Yes, there's another song that's practically identical to it that made the album, but I think if she's going to have the fucking same ballad on there eight times, <laughs> we could stand to have two pictures to burn instead. Good point. Maybe three ballads, two pictures to burn. How about? It, uh, I was I was much more inclined to like this than many of the other more dull songs that were there. Speaking of uh, songs you have opinions on, <laughs> not stuff on the list, we've got The Outside, which both uh, Victor and Julia ranked relatively low. Um, Victor ranked this the lowest, Julia ranked this the second lowest. Uh, feel free to tad team this in any order of the two of you want. Uh, I'm still finding it in my notes. <laughs> well, I'll give you an extra two seconds. This song is boring. <laughs> that wasn't enough time. <laughs> Here's Jamie's comments. What track number is it? Uh, I believe it's track six. Is there ever an instance in recorded history where a tambourine hasn't worked in a chorus, only then to be followed up on the four of the snare in the verse? Um, that's that's a that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, I think he's probably right. Um, I guess I'll go since I'm I'm talking. Uh, and it looks like Mike and I both ranked this pretty high. We both gave it ten points. Steve gave it eleven. Uh, Jamie gave it seven. So uh, there's more fans of this one than not. Um, this was well, apparently at this point, giving it eleven is not good. Right. All right. Well, <laughs> fair enough. Ranking. <laughs> well, I I enjoy this song. I think this was um. This was one of the ones that Taylor wrote when she was 12. So this is one of her earliest songwriting contributions on the album in terms of like going back the farthest in her catalog. And um I think it's a it's a fun bouncy song, but it has like the same like angsty lyrics about just like isolation, but it's wrapped in this bouncy, energetic, happy sounding song. And so I I I enjoy songs like that. I th they work for me. And I think it's definitely a good like um a breath of fresh air after Cold As You. I think you needed that um, relief after how overwrought and dramatic that song was. You needed something fun, so this comes at the exact right point on the album. And I think given how mature the songwriting was for Cold As You, to do something this youthful to contrast that, I think was a very excellent move in terms of sequencing. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I like this one. Uh, Victor, do you have your notes yet? I do. Um, and boy, are these wonderful. <laughs> um, so this song got a lot of bonus points for me because it is so unmemorable that it will never get stuck in my head when our stupid cat wakes me up at four. And 
for that it got it got ranked a little higher than maybe it would um and because that's basically what my notes say i don't have really anything to say about the song itself all right um you know steve you ranked it one point higher than mike but you're probably more negative on it than him so why don't you go and then we'll have mike go Tragically, as negative as I am on this one, I don't really have much to say. Uh, this is just another one where you can hear uh, uh, way too much uh, production trying too hard on it. It's a pretty generic song, and the vocals are crushed into oblivion in a way that doesn't sound very good. But it's not aggressively bad. It's just it's fine if I don't have to listen to it. And Mike, uh, how yeah, are I mean, you? In the, of, in the interest of time, I don't really have anything special to say about it. I liked it more than like the twenty nine ballads on the album, just because <laughs> it's a little more energetic for me. Um, didn't like it as much as my favorite songs on the album. Um, I'm probably like the biggest or second biggest fan of it, though, just uh, based on how all this is going. But just kind of in the middle for me on what I consider to be a pretty nice album. If you guys hadn't said it was energetic, I wouldn't have remembered that at all. It, like the name <laughs> of this song does not spark anything in my mind. I kind of agree with that. I had a kind of it's it's not one that really stands out to me either. Yeah, I think it's fair. I think I heard someone make fun of it and said it was like a Disney Channel reject song. Uh, so that helped it <laughs> stick in my mind more. But as someone who likes Disney Channel songs, I was like, oh yeah, I'm down for this. <laughs> All right, uh, nuts up on the list. Uh, some controversial opinions on this one. We've got Tim McGraw next. Uh, so at the um, yeah, so Tim McGraw is next. Victor, you ranked this uh, the lowest. You gave it three points. What's your thoughts on Tim McGraw? The the song uh, or the or the musician, whatever you want to talk about. I have, no, I have no thoughts on the musician because all country artist names sound the same to me. So I don't know who wrote what. Uh, <laughs> uh i like the chicks and that's it uh and so this is just like a country song and i guess it's not the worst country song i've ever heard um and the uh uh tim mcgraw is doing the backing vocal <laughs> got it um Let's see, Jamie's notes. The first Taylor Swift song I ever heard. Love it. Strange to open an album with a ballad, but a great tune nonetheless. Uh, Steve, how do you feel about this album opening with a ballad? Is it is it really a ballad? Uh, yes. I, mean, I feel like this is a ballad. Okay. I guess I don't really have a, a strong opinion on that. Um, uh, so I rank this one fourth mostly because i was endlessly amused by my own joke that greg uh, will not allow me to make on this uh this particular episode um Ooh, make the joke <laughs> no i don't want to go to jail make make humor legal again <laughs> make humor legal again uh yeah the panel goes woke right. uh this this song really really suffers from uh like this, this album really comes right out the gate with uh, Chapman's uh, like aggressive and bad production choices. Just like he is over processing her vocals so much. I cannot hear the word danced in the chorus as the word danced. It is in no way resembling the word danced. At best, it sounds like he, she's saying datched or something, but it does just sound like she's talking about. Uh, edging to tim mcgraw and that's entirely inappropriate for him to do because uh she was 16 at the time and nathan chapman was a grown-ass man um not cool uh you still made the fun. joke uh. I still did because <laughs> humor's legal again greg <laughs> he's not okay with it humor is legal <laughs> we're not doing a kiss album you're not supposed to talk about underage girls on on oh other God. band albums <laughs> Uh, to be fair, she probably did not know what that that term meant in uh, 2006, being that you know she's straight. Straight people didn't know that word back then. More like Swifty 16. Nathan uh, Chapman's hanging outside of her school, <laughs> waiting for her to leave. <laughs> oh no! Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. 
All right. Uh, I'm just going to have to just plow past that. Um, so I gave this five. <laughs> oh, no plowing, please, Greg. Gee, ah, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, I gave it five points. I think it is a okay song, one of the weaker songs on the album, personally. But also, this is one of the songs where, like, in some ways, Taylor Swift feel like, there's a lot of things about Taylor Swift that makes her feel like a parallel universe version of me, where, just like, I was a girl and was rich and made better choices. Uh, you got better hair than her, Greg. Uh, that's... that's Sometimes debatable. Um, you know, I've been having some rough <laughs> stuff over the hair lately. But um, hey, my idea to like start up my music career is to ride off the coattails of someone famous and name drop them in the song. It's like we did that. Uh, we did that with the Conan song. So that same idea was present between myself and Taylor Swift. She made it work by um, doing. Sure, you it. picked Conan O'Brien, though. I feel like she when she picked you better. Think Barack Obama. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, she, no, I'm saying like she did, she took that same idea, but just like did it in a way where it could be successful. Uh, so I, I respect that. Like, I understand what she did. She made it work and she has an entire career and is now one of the most successful artists in music history on the level of the Beatles and Sinatra. And I am doing a podcast about her. So <laughs> she made the better choices. Uh, it's an okay song. Uh, Julia, you gave this seven points. What's your thoughts on Tim McGraw? Um, this song's pretty boring too. I liked it more when I was younger. Uh, I think that this, as an opener specifically, is the most. I bought a country album at Walmart. Ass opening. There's just something about it that's just like so. Like, here you go, country fans. We've got your little stupid song. Also, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say it how it is because that's what I do here. Her ass is not listening to Tim McGraw. Like, she might know Tim McGraw songs. You know her favorite song is not by Tim McGraw because she's not a country girl. She is trying to be one with her little fake country accent, which I love. I'm not dissing the accent. I love the accent. She's such a fucking coward for dropping it. I hate her. <laughs> anyway, that's my thoughts on Tim McGraw. I, I don't know. As someone who is, like, a big music nerd in high school, like, people would say, like, Greg, you don't really like Al Green. And Steve knows me. He knows I really like Al Green. So I think that if I wrote a, Shoot, I wrote about Al Green in high school. So yes, no, I, I buy it. I buy the Tim McGraw thing. Al Green is better. Tim McGraw is for people in their 60s. And not and, in a And Al way. Green like, isn't? No, but like Al Green is good music. And like <laughs> Tim McGraw, sorry. Sorry to respect a, a country, a beloved country icon. He has some okay songs. I, I, I like some them. Tim McGraw songs. So I, Where the Green Grass Grows is fine. Uh, don't take the girl is one of the worst songs I've ever heard in my life, but that's probably the one she likes. So you know what? Maybe it all makes sense. <laughs> Mike, what's your thoughts don't on take, this one? Don't take the girl. <laughs> yeah, so this one, um, I actually listen to a decent amount of country music in general. So the concept of country albums starting with like mid tempo or even ballad songs um, isn't as weird to me. I mean, coming from a rock background, I don't. Love that. But so I didn't realize how much of a ballad it, it kind of is until I got more into the album. So this one, this poor song for me just like dropped and dropped in my rankings. It was like two or three and then it ended up somewhere in the middle, maybe even second half. Um, it's fine. Yeah, I get it. She's just, you know, like enjoying being a young kid listening to Tim McGraw or whatever. And I get it. Maybe it's kind of a name drop or something. And, and but I don't know how much she does or doesn't like Tim McGraw. She probably likes more of the concept of Tim McGraw. Probably heard of him um, from parents or something. Uh, but in terms of Tim McGraw, I kind of wanted to be a troll because um, one of the bonus tracks is actually a phone call with Tim McGraw. <laughs> it's not a song. It's just like a phone call. Like, Tim McGraw, yeah, it's cool. I wrote a song about you. Whatever. I wanted to rank that as the number one song on the album because <laughs> this podcast tends to rank non-songs above amazing actual songs. Um, so I was going to do that, but then I was like, Greg isn't actually going to factor that in seriously anyway, so I didn't. But uh, I would yeah, have. technically we didn't rank all the, all the tracks on this album. So yeah. here's the thing, Mike. We haven't mentioned Billy Corgan's nipples yet, so you know they rank super high. <laughs> Billy Corgan's nipples, yep. I love the people who are tuning in for the first time who have no idea what any of that means. Like the people who just found the hashtag. 
Go listen to like 200 episodes of the Lipstick Panel to find out what that joke means. <laughs> a valuable use of your time. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I mean, there's a we lot of... We recorded 200 episodes of Lipstick Panel, so who's the sucker here? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the fact that that show had Don't listeners... Worry, you... You've already listened to plenty of Taylor Swift. Go listen to the Lipstick Panel. All right. Next up on the list, we've got Tied Together with a Smile, ranking number eight. Um, I rank this a uh, third from the bottom. Um, again, it's another, you know, slow ballad. This is, again, very sincere teenage girl energy, considering this is about, like, you know, an eating disorder and accepting your beauty. And, you know, not allowing yourself to get into, you know, the the rat race of, like, how good you have to look for boys. And so Taylor writing the song about a friend of hers that had a de- an eating disorder. It's like, that is super authentic teenage girl stuff. And, of course, you know, somewhat um, ironically, in a sad way, she would later develop an eating disorder herself, which she did work through. And it's now, like, a good, healthy weight. So, you know, good for her. Like, she's... Like, she seems very comfortable with her body and, like, the amount that she works out. Like, she seems satisfied with herself. I I don't judge. I don't really care. I'm just glad that she's happy. But uh, this song, um, you know, I, she wrote Tied Together with a Smile. I wrote Gotta Eat When You Can. We're coming at the food spectrum from very opposite ends. Um, but it's, 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 a, it's a good song. But, you know, that teenage girl energy that just... I understand. I think it's sincere. It just doesn't resonate with me as much. Uh, Julia, you gave this 10 points, so I feel like this resonates with the teenage girl energy. Yeah, I mean, definitely. As as a young, impressionable girl, I was like, yeah, this is like, this is so empowering. This is good. I, I actually like the chorus of this song a good deal. Um, And I will hold off from saying anything else because Victor was going to say the other thing that we both feel about this song and I'll let him do that. This song. And I keep in mind, I have listened to every Taylor Swift album. This song has the greatest lyric. She is. And that lyric is the water's high. You're jumping into in it. (laughs) (laughs) He really does sing it like that every time. And once Victor pointed that out, I was like, God, that's so fucking good. And it made me love it all the more. Jumping into in it. Because it's a, it's like, hold on, you're something. No, it's, it's hold on, you're something in, uh, and hold on, baby, you're losing it. The water's high, you're jumping into it. You're jumping into in it because she's, because she's, uh, making it match the losing it. It's great. It rules. It's such a good choice. And letting go. Uh, and I mean, the rest of my thoughts are, this is like one of the good ones. Uh, you're cutting the album down to the good stuff. This is firmly within that. Um, yeah, the song is, I think, uh, aside from that, pretty, pretty decent. Uh, works for me. I like that it is a song that I mean, at at this point, the songs about like ex boyfriends are not oversaturated, so it's not like I was trying to come up for air on a song that wasn't about a boy on this particular album. But I that's because she like, hadn't dated as much. Like the songs about boys, half yeah, them were just I, like I, boys. She imagined what it would be like to date them. It was what she yeah. admitted. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I would say I like this song. This is in the, I think this is like the very bottom of the upper half of my ranking. Um, yeah, I thought this one was good. Uh, Mike, what did you think of this one? You ranked it uh, same spot as me, so third from the bottom. Just you know, another ballad. Just wasn't feeling it as much. Yeah, that's that, that's all it is. Just another a bunch of ballads to choose from on the album. Some's gonna end up at the bottom. Nothing against it, but yeah. Uh, Jamie said, um, tremendously arranged, lovely song. The Mark Knopfler-esque guitar fill in the second verse might be the best bit of the whole album. Um, I I also noted that, that it's it's pretty cool. I mean, it is good. Oh, Greg, you hate Mark Knopfler, right? So I I do, but uh, for me, I, I went, I heard more Mike Oldfield in it, so I still liked it. <laughs> when you think dire straits. 
Uh, Steve, a big Dire Straits fan, gave this 13 points. Yeah, I ranked this third in the sense that, um, like, this is about the least I'm begrudging a song on this album, in that, like, she's a teenage girl. She wrote a You're Beautiful and Valuable No Matter What Anyone Says song, which is fine. That's a good thing for people to do, but I'm just not particularly interested in it. So, uh, you know, I think it's it's good for songs like this to exist, and I appreciate that the instrumentation changes things up a little bit on this one, but uh, I'm just not super into it. I'm not here for it, but I, it gets it gets a pass. It gets the hardest of passes from me. All right, so speaking of songs that Steve isn't into... <laughs> Nest Up is our song, which uh, Steve did not rank the lowest on the panel. Jamie did, but while I get Jamie's notes, Steve, why don't you tell us why our song is trash? Well, this is an interesting one. This is the one that I was probably most familiar with um, because I, uh, you know, I live in Nashville and I hang around with professional musicians. And one thing you have to do as a professional musician in Nashville is you have to play our song for... Uh, uh, college girls and bachelorette parties pretty pretty constantly um and this is interesting because much like basically every smith song uh every smith's cover except for the ones that johnny marr does uh i have never heard a cover of this song that wasn't better than the album version of this this one just really was not treated kindly by by nady boys over processing of her vocals like she's got this weird nasal thing going on and is fighting against the tuning plugin in really ugly ways throughout the entire thing. I think if she had just sung this with her regular voice instead of country affectations through auto tune, you would have gotten a much better result. But she didn't, and I don't like listening to it. Um, uh, fair enough. Jamie's main uh, complaint is that it's fine, but just the album is too long, and that he was just kind of tired by that point. Uh, it's tired when we do the Taylor's albums. Uh, Victor, you rank this as number one. Why is the song actually good? Uh, this song is about like being in a relationship and it going well, which is uh, a, a little atypical for her. Um, it's also a, I mean production choices aside i was listening to it on alternatingly in from car speakers and through youtube so i maybe couldn't hear the production choices uh minutia quite as specifically as steve was um um no i i think this is legitimately a good song um and it's it's one of those ones that's like it is a a just preposterously country subject matter but like done very charmingly and well and i imagine was she the sole writer on this one yeah she was the sole writer this is pure pure taylor energy is this peak taylor on the album yeah definitely like this is like a very very good song and i however i do believe that uh steve's point of anybody covering it would maybe do better than taylor swift could at this time um but like yeah i love the song actually my only disappointment with it is um in the first couple of choruses she ends the chorus by going low and it sounds so great and when she goes like kind of does the more vocal run high uh ending to the chorus for the last one i think it's a little bit of a bummer because it sounds so good when she resolves it down it's so it's like such an a left field choice uh opposite spectrum uh mike you gave it six points but you've been generally favorable so what's your opinion on our song yeah i think it's just another case of like every song has to end up somewhere uh it's what is it, a little bit later on the album so you're kind of like okay but um yeah that was another good one uh not a not a top tier but um better than the 347 ballads on the album for me and <laughs> so um yeah, I don't know if I would make it my song, but I'm okay with being it being their song. So, yeah. Yeah, I gave it a 12 points. So we have Julia close this out, and so she gave it 14 points. Go out on a high note. Uh, I think the song is very good. This was one of the two that I heard from my sister's bedroom a lot. It was this song and Teardrops on My Guitar, which we'll get to later, obviously. Um, 
and I remember the music video like making me a little bit uncomfortable when I was a teenager just because I don't know just like how country coded it was and just I don't know just like the debutante thing and just like oh let's put these southern girls in pretty dresses just like I don't know it just kind of gives me the creep sometimes just like when it's like an underage girl like all dolled up like that I don't know I just it's when you think of like all the adults involved in that process, I don't know. It gives me the willies. Just makes me uncomfortable. Just I don't know. I don't trust Southerners. That's just me. Uh, <laughs> as I live do in the you South know, now. Greg? What? But do you know Greg? Do I know what? I don't know. Just you said I don't know a lot of times. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh, you were you were you were feeling super uncomfortable. Uh, like, hey, I feel like they were sexualizing this teenager for promotion of this music video, and I don't know how to phrase that without saying I don't know every three words. That's true. I didn't. Uh, well, thank you for phrasing that. Yes, I didn't feel comfortable with how they were sexualizing this teenager for that music video. I mean, it wasn't Britney Spears bad, but just like that level of just like christianity says this is okay sexualization of a teenager just makes it even more uncomfortable to me probably you know because yeah, it, you know i was assaulted a by someone who was a, a, a christian and like said no jesus says it's okay like eh, i don't know man um so that's probably where my unco- discomfort comes with it but i mean the song's a banger uh it's really good so uncomfortable with the video but i do think um i, th- I think it's a well shot video i think she performs well um but yeah um Cool song. Uh, Julia gave it 14 points. Yeah, because it's a fucking banger. What's wrong with everyone? Um, I think, okay, coming back to all the like weird production choices of this album and the fact that everyone who's ever covered this has done a better job, like, yeah, no shit. Let's be honest. This girl cannot sing at this point in her life. I would argue that she still can't sing, but we'll get to that later. It's okay. I don't begrudge her. It's okay. You don't have to sing well. You have something else. Um, and this song really is like a perfect encapsulation of what is good about Taylor Swift at this time because it's like this really hooky, poppy, catchy song that's from her unique perspective it doesn't sound like other country songs it sounds like a taylor swift song like i like that about her i like that it's got her all over it but like she is not the artist to go to for interesting musical or arrangement or production choices she's never going to be i mean having listened to her entire discography now that's just not like that's not the point of her uh i don't think that, that they ever really make any choices that surprise you I don't ever think they try to do anything that's unconventional, really. I mean, obviously, she tries to change her sound in ways, but it's still like the structure of these songs and the the chord choices and the arrangements are never going to be like. I'm going to disagree when we get to Evermore. There's a lot of weird time signatures on that album, but we'll get to that later. I was too busy falling asleep. Anyway, (laughs) uh, (laughs) that album sucks. Anyway, uh, this song is fun. I. I have many great memories of listening to it. I think it's fun, and I think, yeah, I mean, this just is like the Taylor Swift package in a song. I feel like there are two major interest groups out there, like super pro Taylor Swift and super anti Taylor Swift, and that like one representative from each side with like unlimited funds each are just, like, texting Julia. Like, I'll give you $1,000 to trash the bitch. No, I'll give you $2,000 if you praise her. Because Julia is just, like, so all over. Like, Taylor Swift sucks. I no, she's amazing. Said, she's just, I like, getting all to... these texts. And, like, okay, I, I, I'll, I'll say whatever you pay me to say. Like, she's like that villain on He-Man where, like, you could, like, change his face. Whatever that dude's name was, that's who she is. <laughs> it's wild. Oh, I, I know that I'm guy. I'm digging it. I'm digging it. Don't get me I, wrong, okay, but it's funny. I mean... That's why I paid. said I have to I have to pull the skeletons out of my closet and I feel like I just have to do like I have to be truthful to the person that I used to be even if that's not how I feel now. Like listening to this album, I was like this is fine. I would never put this on recreationally now. It just doesn't speak to me. I don't like to hear these songs now. But I loved hearing them so much then. That like I said, there's just such a strong nostalgia factor which will carry me through the first three albums, and then it's gone. Then you'll just hear me pretty much bash everything with no mercy, except for a handful. A a true handful of songs will escape my wrath, but, like, these songs are protected by the shield of I was 
at this time a Christian Republican. I was like all the Bible thumping bitch you could ever <laughs> hate in a in a child. I was so opinionated. I I really thought that like this was the only way to exist. And and Taylor Swift was such a great like. Yes, she's just like me at this time. You know, I mean, but but it's. I like this album because I remember being there for it and some of the it helps me see the merit in these songs but the second i abandoned her i'm like i no longer see the merit in these songs <laughs> well maybe you'll be able to come at them with an open mind as you do a critical analysis and like oh now she is uh older and uh on the left like me maybe there is room for both of us to get along probably not i think she got worse though i think she greg i think she got worse later but also, it's just that I, I just, it's complicated. We'll, we'll get there. We'll, we'll, we'll get yes, there. that's why I'm so favorable towards these songs is like, they are so strongly guarded by me trying to be true to that stupid piece of shit I used to be, that dumb, dumb emo fucker, an emo Christian. God, God help me. <laughs> I have, but I have to do this for her. I'm being honest, okay? This is how it is. If I had not had such a strong relationship with these songs, I think there would be a different situation going on here. But no, they've got the shield. Well, you know, we'll see if uh, she ends up listening to the, this podcast. Taylor Swift is actually famous for lurking in like fan projects and discussion groups. Um, not saying anything, but like seeing what people are saying. So what's your what's your message to Taylor? <laughs> of just like, I used to love you. Now I think your stuff sucks. I just... You're hurting her feelings, Julia. You're hurting her I, feelings. I know, I know. I'm first of all, Taylor. I'm very sorry. But second, you. I don't know how. I, like, it would be interesting to have a conversation with her because I wonder how much of this stuff, if it was like unrecorded, she would also low key agree with. Um, or like, it'd be interesting to hear her thoughts on on her evolution as an artist. Um, but I just find that she's a little bit now too insincere for me and too commercial but i i respect that she wants more money and that <laughs> girl, girl boss slay the house down you you're, gonna, you're gonna listen to an indie I'm, record much cooler than hers exactly like yeah, I, I, am, I like became the snob that she loves to write hate songs about and that's okay we're like I think I think we're like yin and yang, you know what I mean? Like we balance each other out and that's why I think we'd be besties. <laughs> Speaking of Taylor Swift's besties, actually uh do we no, I don't uh, we got Mike's thoughts on our song. So yeah, next up is I'm only me when I'm with you. So, uh Julia, you ranked this pretty lo slow. Uh so Taylor Swift wrote the song about um, you know, relationships with besties. So, you don't like it, so maybe you can't be her bestie. No, we're we're gonna be best friends until we die. I swear to God. If she's friends with Lana Del Rey, she can be friends with me, and then I can be friends with both of them. Uh, but but for this song, it's boring, and I don't think the concept is interesting. Uh, you don't think the power of friendship is interesting? No, never. Well, Greg, Taylor Swift, not you. I'm That's true. Uh, again, look, uh, as someone who, like, vibes with the power of friendship hard, I obviously vibe with this song. It's like, look, you wrote a song about friendship? Hell yeah, like, I'm like a walking anime character. Of course I vibe with this. I gave this 13 points. I think it's great. It's bouncy. It's catchy. Um, she actually dropped a bit of the country twang on this one, probably because she was being more sincere. So, like, nah, I dig it. Power of friendship all the way. 13 points. Big Greg energy. So much Greg energy on this track. Uh, Mike, you ranked it as number one. You were feeling the big Greg energy here. Yeah, I mean, for me, this one had big Mike energy. It was like, you know, I'm, I love 80s music. Um, it's funny because uh, Julia said it's like the most boring song on the album. I'm like, what? Like, it's the most not boring. But I, I guess it depends on are we talking musically or I subject I didn't say matter. most boring. Well, well, very boring, very boring. My my fault. Um, like, but yeah, for me, just like musically, I'm like, all right, here we go. You know, it's probably, yeah, you said less country. It's definitely more pop and that's just fun. You know, yeah. Song about friendship feels good. Um, that's more my thing than like the 4,929 ballads on the album. But, um, yeah, I, it, is it number one? Yes. Uh, could it be number two or number three? 
Sure. Uh, is it ranked too low on this podcast? Absolutely. I mean, it's number six. It's respectable. Um, Victor, you, okay. you gave it seven points. Just below Billy Corgan. <laughs> what do you think yeah. about this one, Victor? Um, I really like in the chorus when it goes to the dead strokes instead of the chords. I think that's a fun change up. Yeah, I agree. MG. Um, the actual main riff of the song, I did write uh, Airborne Toxic Event ass riff, um, <laughs> which is not the highest praise. <laughs> uh, uh, and I don't usually watch videos, but because I had to listen to it on YouTube because Apple canceled my Apple Music, won't give it back. Uh, so fuck that. <laughs> um, I, uh, I watched the video on YouTube uh, through the playlist that was assembled and uh i liked the video a lot it's a it's a nice video just kind of a cut together of like taylor swift home video stuff and vaguely written but not really uh not anybody singing at the camera or anything i i thought it was i thought it was nice um yeah i agree it's it was pleasant uh steve you re- gave it six points so you don't believe in the power of friendship or at least when it comes from taylor swift yeah, yeah. I mean, if I believed in the power of friendship, perhaps our band would still be together. Also, COVID. COVID was a pretty, you, yeah. pretty significant factor. So in the band. Ha- ha- yeah. half the time when Steve and I go walking once a week, he's like, are you sure you don't want to get the band back together? Like, no, I'm grumpy and jaded. Doesn't mean we can't still be friends if we don't involve ourselves in artistic projects, dude. Our friendship is stronger than hair metal. Other bands, too. We could start a new band. Anyway, uh, yeah. Um, See, I, I like the power of friendship where I want to actually enjoy all the time I spend with you. And half the time I'm in a band, I'm not enjoying what we're doing. That's fair. <laughs> anyway, uh, so this one is sort of in the slog of songs in the middle that like, I probably could have more or less shuffled their order and not really noticed. Um, I like the driving bass line. Uh, I don't like... How the, how the vocals or the slide guitar happen on the song. Um, and then I think I just docked at some points because it was one of the bonus tracks. So this could have easily just been ranked a good three to five spaces higher. It just wasn't. Fair enough. Uh, Jamie says, a melter. You can hear the next album in this track. Great driving tune. And I, I agree. This is a good, like taste of what's to come because taylor you know the next couple albums are a bit more rock oriented a bit more a bit more up tempo and so it is like a indication of where she will be going next um and um speaking of uh you know a song that's a bit more up tempo rock oriented uh we've got picture to burn next on the list so i uh i gave it uh four points so towards the bottom uh, there's another song Frank, that you're is. The problem. It's me. Hi, I'm the problem. It's me. Um, there is another song on this album that is the same song as this, but better. And that should have said no, which we'll get to later in the ranking. Uh, but like, as oh far as my like, God. As far as like the oh, I'm like really angsty and pissed off. Like, that song has the better angst for me. And this is one of the ones where I actually do see the criticism of her vocals kind of um, failing the piece in a number of ways. Where I think that like some of the teenage girl energy, um, like, the, like m- you know, the awkward way she lands on certain notes doesn't oh, lost quite... lost Greg. Oh, you lost me? I'm losing oh, Greg, too. But he came back, yeah. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, I was just saying that um, I, I think the way she lands on notes in this song, like the the vocal performance is, I think, what hurts this. And the fact that there's a better, in my opinion, like catchier song with a better melody, uh, more angst, more aggression. Just like it's just a watered down version of something much better to come later on the album is why it ranks lower for me. So, yeah, uh, four points. Julia, you gave it 12 points. Uh, feel free to tell me that I'm wrong. You are wrong. Actually, you're not wrong about a lot of things. This is like maybe one of the worst vocal performances in a in anything. It's just really bad. And it was the first Taylor Swift song I ever heard. And I was like, what the fuck is up with it? I hated it. I thought it was the biggest piece of shit. I thought it was so annoying. I didn't like her eyebrows in the music video. 
Um, but I mean, everyone's eyebrows in that time per- period were very bad. But anyway, um, and then all of a sudden, I was like, the more I listened to it, the more I was like, listen, the anger is really driving this one. And as previously stated, I was emo and still am. And there's something about the like pissed off fuck you of this song that kind of helps me ignore how fucking bad the vocals are. Because I'm like, you know what? It's like a a drunk girl at a bar, you know, like it's giving uh, open mic night. This person will never make it, but they have a point to to get out there. It's like she did make it. So, yeah, she did make it. (laughs) <laughs> that's fine um, <laughs> um and also i mean it's funny to say that this is the same as should have said no i feel like those songs are I mean, they're not totally dissimilar but this song is just i heart question mark again but even though she she doesn't sound good in i heart question mark either but she sounds worse in this one but i like the song more i think i don't know it's like it's a bad song but it's a good song um, Mikey gave it 11 points. Uh, what were your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I mean, I think um, that's decent enough. Um, I get the criticism of her voice um, because I did notice that as well. But I I guess in a guy who didn't even think he would ever be listening to every Taylor Swift album and talking about her on a podcast kind of way, I found it more charming. Like, it, I just kind of smiled about it. Like, Especially because I feel like this was almost 20 years ago at this point where I'm like, oh, yeah, she was just like a teen girl on her first country album singing kind of twangy. You know, it's kind of cheesy. It's not like I'm not like, oh, yeah, this speaks to me. It wouldn't have spoken to me back then. And it doesn't speak to, you know, me and my demographic now. But like, I think it's pleasant enough. So I respect uh, I respect it for like what it is, a teenage girl being angsty. And yeah, so um I kind of sm- smile at it more than like cringe at it, even though I, I get it. She, there's times where it's like, that is sound funny on this Taylor. What's going on here? You know, but she's a better singer than I am. So that's okay. Yeah. And you know, there's not to say there's not merit in, you know, s- unconventional singers like, um, uh, Dave Leppard from crash died. He misses a lot of notes on that album, but that is part of the charm. Uh, you know, or like even Ace Frehley's vocals, that, that weird, like missing notes don't really care. Um, it's weirder in the context of like, uh, you know, pop country and things. I still like the song, but like if I have to stick a number on it, that is a reason why it ranks lower where, you know, other songs have better vocal performances. Uh, but Victor, you gave this uh, 11 points. Um, I, I, if I'm going to listen to country songs in general, I do like the sassier, like angry, pissed off ones because it's like, it's a specific perspective, specific perspective. Jeez. Um, so perspective. That's correct. Uh, so I like, I like this generally. Um, the real situation is that Taylor Swift is a coward. She's one of the few people on earth now that could have gotten away with the, and I'll tell my friends, your, your friends that you're gay line. She's one of the only people in the world that could now get away with that and still have a bunch of fans absolutely she never should have changed the line and i hope that in taylor's version she brings it back she has the chance to do something amazing please bring back the homophobic version taylor please and also when i was listening to this album uh on youtube i did get a chick-fil-a ad before (laughs) (laughs) so now she has to do it Uh, do it taylor you're listening Speaking of Christianity, Steve, what's your thoughts on this one? <laughs> I wanted this one to be a pop punk song. I ranked it number two because I could really hear that in the verses. Like if Avril Lavigne had done this song in 2006, um, I still would have hated it because there were a lot of toxic ideas that I really needed to unlearn about like being a poser and things like that. But now I would reflect on it in an Avril Lavigne, if I heard a... For Levine's version of this in from 2006, I'd hear it now and be like, "Oh, dang, this is this is actually really good." Um, yeah, so I'm kind of pulling from Greg's book in that I'm judging the song based on the song rather than the recording because it is still a uh, a Nady Boy production, and I don't love the banjo. I don't like 
country country affectations, but I can hear the heart of a good pop punk song or a good emo song even lying lying in this one. I like uh, yeah, two sure years later, you going. guys are finally taken from the Greg playbook of judging the song, right? And like, oh, when we get to Taylor Swift is when you guys are doing that. The songwriting is all she has. She doesn't have the music. Sorry, it's just so, true. I'm not going to do it consistently. Just this one time. <laughs> and maybe, maybe only when it serves my purposes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, Jamie said, fine, nice, nice, upbeat number. Despite listening to the version on Apple Music, I can't help but shake the OG homophobic lyric. Banjo is 10 out of 10 throughout. <laughs> <laughs> Banjo does rip in this one. It's the homophobic lyric. So was that in this version? No, they don't. It's like, it got, it got deleted off the face of the earth, basically. But it was the real original version and i think they realized that maybe it was a uh, counter to the the message they wanted to send or something it's kind of odd actually that it got it got taken away because it was like the time where that was like just what everybody yeah basically she's not the only one who wrote lyrics like that yeah, she, yeah. She, but she wrote a lyric saying like you know that the boy she was with she's going to tell everybody that he was gay which like you know what for a Christian country artist in 2006 like when you that know the sort of thing a Christian rural teenager would just do right yeah, and the thing she is like, says, you'll tell your friends that I'm crazy and obsessive that's fine I'll tell mine that you're gay that's the line like, and like that is that is very true of like the time like this is remember like Obama wasn't even in favor of gay marriage at this point <laughs> So yeah, like, that's what we no, were I think with... that that's like a time capsule lyric. I really wish she wouldn't get rid of it. I know. I think it's. I, it's I, perfect... I don't know. I I kind of get why she wouldn't want to do that because that's not where she stands now, and she has evolved and grown, and you know, eventually did. Um, you need to calm down, which is just like, hey, stop harassing gay people oh, on God. social media, and also stop harassing me on social media. Um, and you know what? That song's way worse than this one. I think uh, that is. Uh, a fair thing to say in terms of the musicality, but I, I understand why she artistically doesn't vibe with that anymore. In the same way, like think about all the stupid s shit. All of us said when we were 16, like, do we stand by all of it? Really? Is there not any of it? You're like, ah, yeah. that's kind of cringe. <laughs> I've Every never made any mistakes. Bigoted, uh, ignorant word. I did say that I was a Christian Republican horse girl, didn't I? Yeah, oh, you of course. Mentioned I, like, horse girl before. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was, obviously she I was a horse girl. I was the a Christian live Republican. streams. And and I have really high uh, autistic test scores. Of course, I was a horse girl as a child. Are you kidding me? <laughs> um, but like, I mean, yes and no, because I mean, it's kind of like how Haley Williams doesn't do misery business anymore because it's I like think they brought that it back. song is. But, I mean, yeah, I they, don't they, blame they people for being for like, that song does not align with me anymore because I wrote it when I was 16. And like, obviously, like, Misery Business is extremely slut shamey. Taylor Swift also runs into that issue with her earlier catalog. But I think that, I mean, this song is also just a, like, it's a good, catchy song. And I think that while the lyrics haven't quite aged like wine and have gone a little more the milk route, they're not that bad uh and i think it's more funny than anything but I, you know i mean again she's really good at selling an image so she knows what she does and doesn't want to keep out there so i don't blame her for like not wanting to keep that lyric but at the same time i don't know i think it's fun to like acknowledge that and, and not try to completely erase that we did and said problematic things but you know i mean as much as i would love for her to sing the gay line again i i don't think she ever will but I, I wouldn't be mad at her. And I honestly don't think that a lot of her fan base would be as upset about that one because I think all of us are a little gay and we all think that that line's pretty funny. I mean, I, I think <laughs> at that's... At least a little gay, if not a lot gay. <laughs> I, I, think, I think that's a, that's a fair assessment. I Look, I, I don't think she harbors any ill will, but in the same way, like, I look back at, like, you know, Steve and I were in a band called Snake Vomit, and some of the songs that we did in that band, I look back on, and it's like, you know what? That was in poor taste. Uh, oh, I stand by it. I do actually stand by everything, <laughs> every terrible joke Snake Vomit made. I don't, uh, especially after the, 
the shots, shots, shots. I don't know if I stand by that one. That's fair. I, I did quit the band over that one. Yeah, and just like, I, honestly, like, no, that, that was a bad joke. Uh, so bad, I don't even want to... Uh, I'm saying I understand how people grow and evolve, and I get that. And I'm going to say for a girl, a country Christian artist in 2006, it's not that bad. It's pretty tame, and you could probably get yeah. away with it even in today's standards. But I also understand why she wants to shun it. Um, Steve, is this your heart out? No, actually, the meeting got bumped by an hour, so... Oh, I we am going to disappear oh, yeah. for 60 seconds to go get another cup of coffee. Okay. Talk well, amongst yourself or go on to the next song. We'll go on to the next song because I feel like you'll just be like it's about and boring. So. so next up on the list, while Steve is getting his cup of coffee, we've got Teardrops on My Guitar. So this is the fourth place song. Uh, this was the biggest single from the album, I think. I think this charted higher than our song. I think our song had more longevity in terms of the general Taylor zeitgeist. But if you were around in 2006, this was the one that you heard on the radio all the time and got kind of annoying. Um, Mike, you gave this what do you full... Mean? I never got annoyed. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, as look, <laughs> this... Uh, you know, I'll go since I'm talking. This was... I was 16 years old, and, like, I was into hair metal and stuff. This w- This wasn't what I wanted to listen to. Like, I've got teardrops on my guitar. Like, do you really have teardrops on your guitar? Because, like... You have to take the time to, like, write the song and, you know, write everything on the notebook. Like, you're probably not crying the entire time. I don't know if your teardrops are really on the guitar. So, like, I was skeptical of it. I was wanting to party and rock, and I was just like, this is boring chick stuff, man. This sucks. And now, as a sophisticated adult, um, it's, it's good. It's a solid pop song. Not bad. Gave it 11 points, so it ranked pretty high. But, um... Look, in the same way, like, my dad tried to get me to listen to Genesis in that age, I'm just like, nah, man, I'm listening to Rat. My sister is like, hey, you know, Taylor Swift, you know, has these, you know, heartbreaking songs about guys cheating on her. Like, yeah, but Rat has shame, 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 and it rocks, so I don't need this crap. So, yeah, Teardrops, it's a good song, just not as good as the Rat discography. Uh, Julia, what's your opinion on this one? I'm honestly really shocked because of a song that I know has not gotten called yet that is weirdly going to outrank this one, and that just feels like a fucking crime to me, but whatever. <laughs> uh, this was the song that, I mean, here here we go. Like, I was 10 when this song came out. What What is better for a melodramatic, like, mixed up, uh, uh, all of my political and societal beliefs don't actually align with who I am as a person, and here comes this song about, like, this guy who doesn't see me and now I'm just like weeping over my guitar. Here's here's the thing about this song and the people who really latched onto it when it came out. We were all melodramatic Grey's Anatomy fans and this song is perfect for melodramatic Grey's Anatomy fans. I mean, she named her fucking cat Meredith. I forgot to mention that I know so much trivia about uh, Taylor Swift that it's kind of scary for someone who doesn't like her, but I Are really retained a lot of this information. I'm, we're besties, yeah. I mean, my I'll give her Taylor. Call me. I'll give you my phone number. Let's hang out for real. Let's not scare anatomy. People uh, keep sending uh, Julia more and more money from each side, and she's just her head's about to explode. Listen, I think I can like dislike a lot of the things that she does and a lot of the music. I mean, all like most of the things that she has done. I hate all the private jet stuff, obviously. Yeah, but I that's not exclusive that. to her. I I hate rich people. Period. Um, and I do. Th- I I have a lot of issues with Taylor Swift. I do. But like do she I pays think her we'd have a bad well. time if we hung out? Absolutely not. I think if we hung out, we would have a great time. Um, but I mean, yeah. Do I even like all of the things that my own friends do? No, absolutely not. But if we were, I, I think we would be good friends because we're uh, melodramatic Grace Anatomy girlies. Um. This song really struck a... No, I'm not... Okay, this song really um, hit home for me. Uh, it made me want to be a songwriter because I was like, wait, if it's as easy as just like strumming a few chords and singing like diary entries over it, I can do that too. Uh, and so this like really kicked off my like, maybe I can do the singer-songwriter thing. And like these lyrics are just so real and raw. Like they don't feel like like someone trying to write or this is how i felt at the time it doesn't feel like someone trying to write lyrics it's just someone like 
talking to you. Like these are conversations with a friend and yeah. And listening to it now, I'm like, I think uh, this song is one of like three where I'm like not completely pissed off at how bad it is. I actually think that this is a good song and I'm, I can count the number of good songs that she has made on one hand. I think, um, and this this one I think makes the cut for me. I'm really distressed at the songs that are left out right now. Something has gone horribly wrong. I just don't. I'm getting mad looking, so I'm just gonna move on. <laughs> oh, uh, Steve's uh, biggest uh, fan is in the chat. Uh, Michael in the chat is the guy who constantly is saying that Steve's music sucks uh, in my comment section. So hi, Michael. Your your arch nemesis. <laughs> Rage and Fury. Wait, he says my music sucks or my music opinion sucks? Uh, I think both. Um, <laughs> Fair, just so long as we're, like, consistent. You can do it all. <laughs> I'm a double threat. Uh, what's the third thing I do that sucks? I could be a triple threat. My fashion's not great. Yeah, there you go. Your house um, is all blurry. House is all blurry. <laughs> but for the for the mic that is actually uh, in the uh, the video chat, Mike, what's your opinion on teardrops on my guitar? Yeah, I'm laughing because um, Julia Julia oh. likes this song a lot more than I do, and yet it's funny because she said that she could probably count on one hand the amount of Taylor Swift songs she likes, and I'm like, oh man, like I need more than one hand just to count the songs I like from this album. Um, so like I like and dislike Taylor Swift more than I'm like the bell curve, and then Julia's just hitting them. I don't know what's going on here. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think this song's ranked too high. I don't know. Again, I don't know if it's just for my leg. I don't like need all these ballads perspective. Um, I think I ranked uh, a perfectly good heart above this one. I think that's a better song. Um, and I'm still a little bitter that uh, I'm only me when I'm with you uh, is below this one. I think that's a much better song. Um, and I'm surprised that no one has said it yet. This is actually the only note I have coming into this entire podcast. Um, now, on one hand, I get Taylor Swift was like a teen girl. She was young and everything, so I'll give her that. I'll also recognize that she ended up uh, being very famous, and she's like a billionaire, so clearly she's doing life a lot better than I am, so there must be something to that. But I am surprised that with the money that was thrown at this and the songwriters and the production team and everything, how did they end up with... Wishing on a wishing star. Oh they couldn't my say God. falling star, <laughs> shooting star, shiny star, lucky star. Wishing on a wishing star. Like that that that's the only lyric. I mean, you talk about cringe lyrics or whatever. I can laugh at a lot of them for her being a teenager. But he's like, yeah, I I wrote better songs as a teenager than that. Or better lines. Better lines as a teenager than that. And I'm not even a musician. I don't know. Some about that one. No one thought to say, hey, that's a little boring. Hey, that's a little repetitive. Like, I don't know. I don't know why that grates on me. That's not why I ranked the song low. That's not, like, the only thing I have against it. I just don't think it's one of the better songs on the album. But Wishing on a Wishing Star? Come on. I don't know. Maybe that's Come just a thing me. they say in Pennsylvania. Oh, is that a Pennsylvanian thing? Is it? I, I don't <laughs> no, know. I know. I'm just kidding. Yeah. I've only ever been on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. All I know yeah. of Pennsylvania is the sucky yeah. parts. And Philadelphia. Philadelphia is cool. Uh, Victor, you gave the song uh, 10 points despite that line, so what's your thoughts? Uh, I, I think this one actually kind of goes back to the, like, you know, things when you're 16 or whatever writing a song that maybe you don't stand behind. Although I, I do get the feeling that Taylor Swift does stand behind naming real people in songs, which it's like, when it's an already famous person, whatever, but also, like... I'm not saying dude named Drew old. from your school. Yeah, I'm not saying a 16 year old can't write a song about somebody that she knows, but I think the weird part is then putting it on an album that goes on to sell a bajillion copies. Played this song particularly got played on the radio a lot too, so it's probably like Drew looking over his shoulder for the next decade. No, he was too busy beating his kids to do that. Is is that what happened? Yes, uh, I think that's what happened. Um, I'd have to look that up in another tab. Or Steve can. You can do that as we get ready for your I comments. Can, I can do some research. But would he have done that if he had only dated Taylor Swift? And... 
No, the what <laughs> she could fix him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was arrested for aggravated child abuse in 2015. Oh my fucking god! Well, you know, here's the we start a song about that. Well, here's 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 what I will say. You know how Ooh, you sucks. look back at the people you went to high school with, and you're just like, oh, that guy, you know, got arrested for child beating, and just like you know, someone you or oh, that you know, girl got pregnant, and you know, whatever. Like you know, you you look at like where people's life trajectory went after high school. And some of the people you had a crush on, and then you look at them today, you're like, oh my god, what was I thinking? When you see where they ended up. This was 2015 in Hendersonville, Tennessee, so that's like 20 minutes from where Greg and I lived at the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's a All of our musical heroes over. keep on get, doing crimes, Greg. I mean, he's not a I musical grew, hero. She's <laughs> <laughs> Bruce Taylor's album, my musical hero. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, the the point stands like you know when you're a teenager, the people you think you're in love with because you're a dramatic teenager, and then you grow up like, oh, I just had bad taste. Like that's just. Oh, geez, he gave a three year old a concussion. Uh, Jesus Christ, Drew. Cheesy, cheesy beats, Drew. Mm. Um. It's a shame because he is singing backup vocals on this song. <laughs> <God damn it. laughs> so uh, for the folks at home, I'm allowed to laugh because I'm also a victim of child abuse. And <laughs> but ah, oh, Jesus Christ! But yeah, so true um, piece of the, shit. The but he had a good song written about him. Yeah, and he tried to say is- anything Taylor Swift right before she wrote this song, apparently. She like Whoa. showed up and was standing in the, her driveway trying to get her attention. Oh, what a loser! No, sorry, this was after the song was released. Yeah, he tried to say anything to her after the song came out. Was it with the Tim McGraw song? And she was like, "I don't know who that is." <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh. Did you write this? Uh, let's see. Uh, Jamie says, amazing song. Don't know why it needed a pop version, to be honest. The harmony vocals in this are everything I love in early Taylor Swift. It's something I always missed since her gradual transition into pure pop. So basically, um, he, uh, really likes the, um, uh, backing vocals on this album and would probably disagree with you pretty heavily on the production of this. But unfortunately, uh, time zone shenanigans. Uh, Steve, what's your thoughts on Teardrops on My Guitar? Ranks this one uh, pretty low. Um, just you know, everyone everyone writes these sad sack incel songs when they're fifteen or whatever. Um, but eventually, it reaches the point where you know, in your thirties, you don't want to listen to some random teenager's sad sack incel anthem. And you're like, eh. I was too late to the party to get into this song. So you're like, I got a wife low. now. I'm not an incel. <laughs> I don't need right. this. Oh, yeah, Greg, you had mentioned the pop version, which I forgot I had included in my ranking because I remember seeing it on the Spotify like track was like pop version. And I was like, that's going to be really stupid. <laughs> and then when I listened to it, I'm like, I actually like this version a little bit better. And uh, they're barely comparable. I think that it just added a little bit of like a little bit of some, some a little bit of beat, uh, you know, a little more energy that I like. Um, but I don't think it drastically changes the song or anything like that. Uh, fair enough. I if as far as someone who I'd expect to say I need a little something something a little beat that you are not the person on this panel I thought I would hear that from. Uh, but then again, I, um, you, you are you are from Chicago, so you got that uh, authentic uh, you know uh, hip hop quality about you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So nuts up on the ranking is the song I ranked as number one. Big Greg energy from this song. We've got Mary's song, parentheses, oh my, my, right. my. And that's on the list. Ranking number three. Wow, I forgot we hadn't Greg. gotten to this song yet. Uh, that's why I'm so right, fucking mad. <laughs> yeah, that's why I, I'm fucking pissed. That's why, how on I don't, earth hate, I don't hate it, but that's way too high, yeah. All right, oh. let me defend myself. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's cute. I obviously understand, you know, Steve was talking with me about this song, about the idea of just like, you know, 
grooming and such and the you know way one could interpret the lyrics of the song but i think there is something cute about just like you know two uh like neighbor kids growing up together gradually falling in love with each other getting married and then being together until they're in their 90s like that is cute that is cute and i feel like she was touched by their story which was based on you know people that she met and talked to and was inspired to write the song and it just it's so endearing and warm fuzzies and just like uh-huh. a nice you're lost, Greg. Oh, and you're back. Oh, yeah, uh, sorry. Uh I don't know how much uh got lost there. But I was saying, I I like the endearingness of the song. The the warm fuzzies. It feels good. It feels sincere. It just feels nice. I know that there's no angst. And I know it's very country, but this is, it's so damn earnest and pleasant. And it has that big Greg energy of just like unabashed optimism. I like it. Julia, okay. go ahead. You ranked it the lowest of the bunch. <laughs> um, yeah, this song blows. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm just really mad right now that this had the, I don't know how this outranks, like, our song for example because i think that one's much cuter and that one feels more aligned with taylor swift's like actual vibe this one is it's just too like it's too christian it's too like nicholas sparks for me like i said i like i like her gray's anatomy songwriting i hate her nicholas sparks songwriting (laughs) and she is overall a nicholas sparks songwriter like this song is so white bread to me. I think the harmony work is nice, and that's probably the only thing I have in favor for it because it's just too like <laughs> we grew up and like I don't like I do not actually uh like the childhood neighbors to old couple timeline. I think it's boring. <laughs> I don't. It's just too. It's too boomer. It's too boomer coded. It's too. <laughs> I, I I don't know. Yeah, Greg, this is why you like it and I don't cuz you're a damn boomer and I'm not. Um <laughs> I mean, I am a damn boomer <laughs> like <laughs> I think I think like sound-wise I can see how this song is like somewhat appealing cuz the the chorus is like okay, but I think just the story of this song is uh, I don't know. It's it's not interesting, and and I, I I don't hate all country music. I hate lots of country music, and this is one of them. This is why, because it's just like, what what are we doing here? It's just too like everything was nice, and like <laughs> our moms were like, oh, they're in love, and they were right. And I, I don't know. This is for people who do gender reveal parties. <laughs> Thank you. Once once again, I'm in agreement and disagreement with Julia because we both agreed that this song is way too high, and yet I'm like, no, but it's still a nice song. I still like it. Um, uh, I I know I was a little bit confused about because it's called Mary's song. So at first, I thought it was about like her and her friend Mary growing up, and then I it, it, so like it took me a couple of listens, you know, because I'm in my car, not really paying attention or whatever. And I'm like, oh, okay, I get what's going on. But yeah, at first I thought it was just like a nice song about childhood friendship or whatever. Um, which also would have been okay either way, friendship, romance, whatever. Um, minor, minor gripe. And it's not even just, I just have to say it. It's not, it's not against this album, even it's against the dozens or hundreds of albums where this has happened in music history. It always drives me crazy when their song title, the song titles are like the same thing, like back to back on an album. Cause you have Mary's song and then you got our song. And that just always drives me crazy. Like, I hate when there's an album with a song that's like, I don't need love, track number three. And then track number four is like, I'm here for your love. And I'm like, what? Like, you can't put <laughs> those back to back on it. an album. Unless, unless it's actually like telling a storyline, like it's a concept album or something, which like 99, maybe even 100% of the time it isn't. Anyway, dumb gripe. Not, you must not have really hated lipstick albums with how many songs had rock in the title. Well, there does get to be a point where you're just like, we write songs about rock. So some exceptions in there. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Mary's song, our song. But I like both of them. Uh, Victor, did you sense the big Greg energy from this song? 
Um, I don't think this would have been my guess for your number one, but it makes sense now, uh, having heard your explanation and you saying that it was your number one. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> um, I, I think my notes on this one were also pretty sparse, and it was very much in the camp of, I think I like it, and it's like right in the middle of my ranking. So it's, I think, in the, it would, if I'm cutting this down to just songs that I was vaguely positive on or higher, it would make my cut. Um, but it mostly received points for being a song that was so unmemorable that it won't get stuck in my head when our cat wakes me. Uh, let's see what Jamie said here. Great, so great song. Almost as good as Stay Beautiful. She recycled this formula a lot on later albums, a.k.a. Um, like this is less of a personal song for her and more of a I'm trying to tell a narrative song. You know, the, the Springsteen influence uh, seeping in and whether or not that's a good thing. I think she did move towards doing a lot more of that later on in her career, which... Uh, is probably, you know, Julia doesn't like the song as much and also doesn't like a lot of her later career stuff. I don't think that's necessarily a coincidence. I think this is part of that, you know, I want to be a storyteller in my songwriting being established on this first album. And me, who, you know, loves Thin Lizzy and stuff like that, like, yeah, tell me a story. But the counter, which I feel would be, tell me an interesting story. And so it's whether or not you find the story interesting. <laughs> I find it... I find it endearing. I'm a softie. I, I like just like a just saccharine love song. So it works for me. Melts my little heart. Uh, Steve, you gave this nine points. What's your thoughts? Yeah, so I, I put this one in the middle. Um, I was probably meaner in my comments that it really deserves. This is one where like it ages in a weird way, especially being a song that you know, a songwriter who is based in Tennessee, where like we're in a state that is dealing with a lot of shenanigans of you know uh, elected leaders trying to make it so that if you mention that gay people exist in a book that children might read, you should go to jail because uh, quote unquote grooming. Whereas this whole idea of like dads talking to their little kids and be like, "Oh, son, you got a girlfriend yet?" Even though you're only six, like that is also distinctly a form of of grooming and you know indoctrinating kids to uh to, to specific standards but you know society considers that generally okay uh so that's a little bit weird in the modern context but the 80 year old neighbor who the song was about she probably gets a pass because it was her actual lived life and she came from a different time um mostly where it's weird in this song is just how much of uh, uh nate is in this song his his voice and his fingerprints are very heavy on it. Uh, so that distracted me a lot, but otherwise, you know, it's sort of a middling song. Greg, I'm curious because you mentioned uh, Thin Lizzy. How many Thin Lizzy albums would you put this debut album above? Um... Probably at least the first two, and then I don't know if I would put it above any of the other Lizzie albums. I'd have to think about it. Maybe better than Nightlife? Maybe. Um, but, you know, I think Nightlife has higher highs. But I, I would probably put this above Nightlife also. Um, if I'm doing the Taylor Swift Thin Lizzie catalog ranking, yeah, probably somewhere around there. So, I mean, but hey, it's no Thunder and Lightning. She doesn't scream "God damn" and beat someone to death in a bar fight. <laughs> I I will say she that leaves that to Drew. <laughs> I will say that your answer is at least fair, if not more than fair, given how much you live th love Thin Lizzy. I basically just wanted to make sure you weren't like it is not as good as any Thin Lizzy album, because then I was going to call you full of shit. But uh, okay, fair enough answer. I can live with that. Okay. Yeah, like the thing is, still in uh, love with you is on nightlife, and I don't know if anything here is as good as that one song, but I think the rest of it like is competitive enough where I might give it the overall edge. But I'd have to think about it. Um, Mike, would you have liked it more if in the sequencing it had been Mary's song and then our song and then a song called My Song? <laughs> I mean, yeah, at that this point, if you're going to double down, then you should triple down, yeah. So, rule of I guess, three. Probably. I'd have been like, okay, we're doing the song block now. Okay, yeah. Like, I, I, Honestly, I just pointed that out because that's been a pet peeve of mine on albums for years. Like, 
It always just it, looks like late, especially when, like I said, when they go against each other. Like, I don't need love. I'm so in love. Like, I, what? I, like, I, I don't I, know. I hadn't really, like, put the words to that thought before, but I have, I have thought that same. So I was very. I cannot wait to get to speak now. We're going to have so much fun, you guys. I mean, I, I, I don't know what you mean by that, but I'm, I'm excited for it uh, because I, I like it. I don't know how much I want to say, especially because I don't want to take up too much time, but there is a song that is so against the overall theme of that album that it's actually insane, and the place it falls in the sequencing is even crazier. It rocks. I cannot wait. Nice. Well, hey, we're at the number two song in the ranking, so let's let's keep this momentum going. So number two in the album is Stay Beautiful. Uh, Mike, you gave this 14 points, so this is exactly where you would want it in the ranking. Tell us about Stay Beautiful. Yeah, that is a great song. It was a sleeper song for me. So Tim McGraw and Stay Beautiful had like opposite trajectories for me. Because um, honestly, I was kind of just ranking the album as I went, so Tim McGraw... Just started at number one, and then as more songs came in, I kind of you know shifted down. And then I re you know after listening to the whole album, I reviewed again, and Tim McGraw just kept getting bumped down lower and lower. And Stay Beautiful kept going high because I'm like, this is a nice song. I really like the melody. It's really, I'm just really digging this song, and it just it kept going higher and higher. And um, it was like top five. I'm like, that, that's pretty good. About five or four is good. And then like three, two. I'm like, this is yeah. So I think it's a really just good song. Um, it was it was one like when earlier we mentioned the outside and I was like crap I can't remember anything about that I think Victor said the same thing like I don't know, I don't remember anything about it Stay Beautiful was the opposite it would come on and already I was like you're beautiful you know like I could hear it already uh, in my head so that um, that's a legitimately good Taylor Swift song like I would you know uh, all all Taylor Swift jokes aside or whatever you know people who hate her for being too famous or rich or whatever like. Stay Beautiful is one where I'd be like, no, this is a jam. She made this happen. I'll give her credit for that. Uh, fair enough. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's a good song, too. I give it six points, but the thing is, like, I don't dislike anything on this album, even Invisible, which I ranked at the bottom. I don't dislike anything. I would say these are all good songs, just, you know, varying degrees of good. I think it's uh, pleasant. I think this is... Um, you know, it's nice that to hear a song where like the leering eye is a girl and just like, oh man, that guy, he's hot is basically what this song is. Um, but it's done with like the, it's done with like a non-aggressive tone. Done by a Christian horse girl. It's done by a Christian horse girl. So I don't know. I, I think it's cute. I think it's pleasant. Um, bouncy. It's catchy. It works for me. I, I like it. Julia, what do you think about Stay Beautiful ranking number two? Uh, I feel bad about it. This song's stupid. Um, <laughs> it's just like, it's so fucking cheesy. And I, I'm an, I mean, this is probably kind of obvious with how I ranked stuff. Uh, I hate positive and uplifting songs. I just can't stand them. So you hate this our discography. Too, it, yes, <laughs> obviously. I don't like want, I, here's the thing. There was like a, a point in music where every song that was coming out was just like, I'm confident and I'm I'm happy and I was like this is the worst time to be alive. I need you all to like chill. Like when Happy by Pharrell Williams came out, I a part of me just like fucking died cuz <laughs> I just like I I can't fucking do this. Like shut the fuck up. Stop it. Um and this one I think fell into basically once we get past my number 5, which was Cold as You, Every other song on this album, I just don't really care about. And so I ranked them in no particular order. Uh, and I'm seeing now that I put Stay Beautiful kind of high, but like it, to me, might as well have been on the bottom. Any of the ones that I put below Cold As You could have just been on the bottom for me. Like the song is just like, it's, it's just too upbeat. It's too uplifting. I don't like songs that say like, you're so beautiful, never change especially because we know how shitty all of us were at that time. Everyone was not beautiful and we all should have changed. And I don't know what Corey ended up doing, but I'm sure it was also something terrible. I just, yeah, mm, no, thank you. It's, I need, I need my Grey's Anatomy angst. This is not giving it to me. And so this song has not aged well for me. 
Victor, you gave it 12 points. Do you actually like the song, or is it just like, eh, I rank it towards the top? I, I can kind of go back and forth on the subject matter of it, but from a like kind of musical rhythmic perspective, I like how it stands out on the album. It's, yeah, very bouncy. It's kind of a nice mix of sort of a country arrangement with more of a, um, like, poppy outlook, I guess. Um, so I... Yeah, I would say I genuinely enjoy this one. Um, it was not a uh, a thoughtless or like an uncaring ranking. I'm a little surprised it's this high, um, but I guess I contributed to that. Yeah, you did. Um, you ranked it for the also, highest. <laughs> um, I um, I do like the 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 ending bit where she just says "beautiful, beautiful, beautiful" in the rhythm. I know it's funny though. <laughs> uh and when a song is funny, that's that's better than being good. So that's why you like our songs. <laughs> Doesn't hurt. Uh Steve, you gave the seven points. Thoughts on Stay Beautiful. I mean, I I docked this points for the same reasons that uh that Victor liked it, that um it just got to the last full quarter of the song. It's like, oh, they just they just stopped writing, but let the song keep going. <laughs> it's also the one that I described entirely in uh, in rock and roll cliches. Uh, my notes call this one all filler, no killer. And uh, I describe uh, Nathan Chapman and his voice as being the poor man's Mutt Lang. Oh, and... that was actually that was uh, that was Corey singing. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, so Corey is the poor man's Mutt Lang, which is tragic because Mutt Lang is already the poor man's Michael Anthony. So we're just not having a good time here. Jamie is so wow. upset that he's not on this episode. J- like, I Mutt feel- Lang, is the poor man's Michael Anthony. I, I love. I'm. I have so many thoughts on that. Not, not even in a bad way, but like, I, I want to just have a whole podcast episode <laughs> about that now. As, as a guy who loves the work of both, and we'll do an episode not- called the poor man's. The poor man's Mutt Lang. And did not expect that coming from you, Steve. Um, so, wow. So much, so many thoughts on Jamie that. is going to fly to bad. America and fight you now. What? <laughs> <laughs> I, I really hate those Shania Twain songs uh, that he did. Yeah, like he. And I like Van Halen. Uh, all right. Um... Yeah, I guess. No, I just. That's. I'm not even disagree. I don't even know if I agree or disagree. I feel like they serve different purposes. Obviously it's, similar in terms of vacuum. It's back such a hot it. take. You can't taste it because you just burn your mouth. <laughs> it's just true. Molten and you're, is this good? Is this bad? It's just too hot. Yeah. That, take, those, is yeah, just, I, that I, take is just lava. It's just you will die if you try to process <laughs> it. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm here for it. I, 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 I kind of want to agree with you. I, don't. I feel like you get different. I, just feel like it's, I, I want wow. to say Steve is full know, of shit, I so I'll just do that instead. I just feel like it's, you get different things. I wouldn't have one do the role of the other, so I'm, so I'm like, but ultimately, which one do I prefer? Oh uh, wow! Uh, but anyway, we, this isn't the Michael Anthony Mutt Lang podcast, so dang. okay. Uh, what about a song with both? That would be something. Jamie ranked this as number one. He said, the best song on the album, one of my very favorite Taylor Swift songs, has everything I love in it. Amazing arrangement, great vocals, killer harmonies, loads of lovely low leads in the left and right ma- from mandolins, fiddles, dobros, etc. Uh, so the guy who's really into the uh, Mutt Lane production loves this. Um, so, whew. <laughs> whew. All right, Jamie, I guess just tell me where and when we're fighting. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> did you have did you have any other commentary on the song? I don't even remember because I was just processing that insanely hot take. <laughs> no, that was it. That was all my commentary. Okay. Uh well we're at the number one song in the ranking, which I predicted um from the very beginning when I first listened to the album for the podcast. I'm like, yep, that's gonna win. So from the bottom to the top, let's go over the ranking. Invisible. A perfectly good heart, a place in this world. Cold as you. I heart question mark. The outside. Tim McGraw tied together with a smile. Our song. I'm only me when I'm with you. Pitch it a burn. Teardrops on my guitar. Mary's song. Parentheses. Oh my my my. Stay beautiful. But the best song on Taylor Swift's self-titled debut, according to this panel of 
people who are gathered, I won't call them experts, um, is should have said no. <laughs> So, Julia, your number uh, one song, you were the only person to rank this as number one, and it is number one in the ranking. Why don't you take the lead on this? This ranking is a fucking disaster. Um, this song has it all. It's got the drama. It's got the angst. Uh, I mean, it... I, I, as, for as vocally weak as Taylor Swift is at this time, I do think that these are her most earnest performances um and this one i just i really do feel i'll never forget watching her on the i think it was the mtv awards when she sang this song and i was like oh she's really nervous huh like she sounds really bad she could not carry this song which is funny because it's not that hard to sing um and then it kind of turns out that's just what she sounds like live but in the recorded version anyway i mean yeah, this this really gives Disney Channel to me. Um in it but in in the most positive way. Like this is better than what Disney Channel I think really realistically spurned out, but yeah, the the emotion of this song uh I I I think this was easily the song I listened to the most. Had it on repeat. I should mention I never had a boyfriend uh or a girlfriend for any of my school years. I, I was the most perpetually single person, but I think that only makes the songs about like these cheating ass losers even worse. <laughs> like I'm like, okay, I think here's, here's why I think I connected with Taylor Swift is that we are both people who live in our own imaginations. I don't even know if this happened to her because she is so far in the world of make believe and like, as that goes on, she's like making up even more stories about her life and like what she's doing and what's happening to her. This one's like more grounded. Um and it's it's believable enough because she's able to sell it. But yeah, this is definitely a perfect song for for Grey's Anatomy girls. Okay. This one's not Nicholas Sparks. <laughs> this one is Grey's Anatomy. It confirmed. We've got we've got so much drama. And I think that's why even now I'm just like rocking out to it even though it's i mean you know it's it's a very uh immature song but it, i think that's what's good about this one it, it works in its favor so jamie ranked at the lowest he said that daft little fiddle noise at the end of the first course has always wound me up nice to hear some distorted guitars uh so my prediction as to why this would win was because like the song rocks and we just got like a bunch of hard rock people on the panel and people who like angst. It's like, Oh, it rocks and it has angst. It's going to win. And it did. Uh, Steve, you gave it 10 points. What's your thoughts on this one? So this is in that, uh, slog of the middle towards the upper end of it, I guess. But this one, this one is another one that suffers a lot from, uh, just like the weird production of things. Um, one interesting thing I noticed is, uh, the second to last chorus, there's a really weird edit point in the middle of begging, in begging for forgiveness. And I went and I compared that to the rest of the choruses, and that only happens on that chorus. So presumably she actually did go through and sing separate takes for each each uh, chorus through the song instead of just being flown around like you would get with a, a more modern pop production. So that's kind of interesting, but it is a really weird and rough edit. And... I'm not sold on some of that banjo playing in the song. There's a part of me like, here's the way those lines are going. I'm like, did is that MIDI? Is that a MIDI banjo? <laughs> and then that draws throws the whole thing into into uh, suspicion. Like, is all is all of the banjo on this album MIDI? Does Nathan play instruments for real at all? I mean, that's hey, my conspiracy theory. I anyway. mean, he probably plays at least a keyboard for the MIDI. <laughs> Yeah, probably. Just in terms of pure practicality, that's easier. Um, Just like ragging notes one at a time. <laughs> right. Fast banjo <laughs> runs. Uh, Victor, you gave this 13 points. You also ranked it pretty high. What's your thoughts on this one? This is one of the few on this album. Like, and as you said, this is a this is a uh, uh, a panel full of people who like harder, rock. rockier stuff. <laughs> your stuff so it's like this song 
more than most on this album sounds fun to play <laughs> like even if it's just the simple like bam 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 like doing the the everybody stops playing at the same time like that's just that's fun even if it's like not groundbreaking or whatever like it's good to do fun stuff um and yeah this song i i I don't know if i ever mentioned it like we've talked a little bit about the varying quality of her vocal performances on this album and like um some of the other ones there was uh which song was it uh picture to burn it's really like she does not have the juice and it's made worse when you watch the video and it's like her lip syncing and it's like this is might as well not even be you singing like it's so just wrong to look at and in this one i admittedly didn't watch her lip sync to it so maybe that helped but like she has she's at least in the neighborhood of having the juice for this one which is i I think helps a lot um and it also has a big minor chord at the end, which is what R.E.M. would have done with the same song. So that's good. Mike, you gave it 12 points. What's your thoughts on this one? Yeah, so I mean, a lot of a lot of thoughts on this and, and just the comments that have been said, because, yeah, I agree. It's one of the best songs on the album. Um, and Greg, I got to give you credit uh, for like really knowing knowing your group of friends here, because when you were saying, oh, I knew it was going to be number one. I'm like, what is he talking about? Like, I was surprised. Not because I don't like it, but you are correct in terms of who we are and what we like. So well done for you on that. I or was so he says thinking, he hasn't shown anyone think? his math. Oh, true, true. Um, I was thinking that I was gonna rank it maybe the high. I'm pleasantly surprised that you guys agree uh, overall. Um. Uh, and Victor, I think you make a great uh, point. Uh, I like your term juice. Um, Cause yeah, I said earlier, picture to burn is fine, but it's one of those songs where, uh, you know, she comes across kind of as like a teenager or whatever. Um, and, and not that this song doesn't also maybe have some teenage angst or whatever, but it's a lot more believable. Like this could be, this could be like by a, whoever is considered to be a legitimate rock band and, you know, and done in their style or whatever, like I think would, would, come across uh pretty believable um so i'd never heard this song before until you know listening for this podcast and i'm listening to it i'm like where have i heard what this is very familiar so my cousin uh who is a musician released his uh first solo album last year he has a song called dick which is basically about him and bad relationships or him being the the bad in his relationship or whatever and just being a dick um he it, he he unknowingly, unintentionally ripped off this song or whatever. So I said it to him. I'm like, "What what's going on here, man?" He's like, "Dude, I." He's like, "Yeah, I hear it. I've never heard this song before, but you're right." Um, so I see Greg here, um, trying to prove his math. Of course, he just typed those in. It's all a lie. But, <laughs> yeah, listen to uh, my cousin Brian's song, Dick. I'll type it in here. But um, it's just funny to me because uh, there's definitely similarities. Um. Yeah, it's just a really good song. I like it. I agree with uh, what you guys are saying here. And, um, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I I ranked it uh, second place. So, I, you know, I think it's a good song. I think it's well executed. I think it uh, is weird that this one was not the single and that we got Pitch of the Burns the single instead. Like I said, I think they're... Similar songs, but I think this is just a better version of that same song, which, you know, Julia, who was upset with how low I ranked Pitch of the Burn, still ranked this higher than Pitch of the Burn, so technically I'm right about this. <laughs> and, I, yeah, that's basically all I have to yeah, say. It's I a good song. I agree that I like this song better. I can see why Picture to Burn was a single, because I feel like that one's more country, and, like, that's... He was a country artist at the time or whatever, so I can see why they pushed that one instead of this one, even though I think this is the better song. And, you know, there, there are people who talked about how this song was derivative of Before He Cheats because you can't just, like, have two people writing about the same lyrical subject matter ever. Otherwise, that's derivative. Um, so, really, the only original artist out there is Steve. Hooray! But yeah, so, I am surprised by the number of boys on this album. Like the sheer number of specific confirmed boys that she name dropped. Right. Apparently, but she, the guy she, that she wrote this song about is named Sam, 
and they continued to date after the incident in question. How many how many guys are actually in there? Because I'm thinking of Drew, and what was the other one? Corey? Or Corey. How, how, what are the other ones? Tim McGraw. Well, yeah, I'm not including him. <laughs> <laughs> guys, unless she dated Tim McGraw, then he would count, but... Well, she oh, didn't. God. She didn't date Corey either. She just thought he was hot. Okay. Well, yeah, I meant of her peers or whatever. Also, she, she I did think a collab with Tim McGraw. And... Doesn't that count? That's a peer if you do a collab with them. Yeah. Also, Corey right, was so, like. I, I, we were pretty much time. in agreement on this podcast, and now I've, I've grown <laughs> sick of you. <laughs> there we go. We had to get there at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Corey, Corey was a friend from fourth grade. Yeah, I've been so, back on a pier. She didn't grow up with Tim McGraw. The idea, the idea of them dating would have been a, the actual idea of them dating was a little, perhaps, suspect. A little bit sus. I mean, but like sus. I said, these are all like fantasy songs. I think that's why she gets such a bad rap for it being like she dates too many guys like no she dates a normal number of guys for someone her age at all times but she writes about all of them like they've each had a deep and serious relationship that has gone on for a long time but all of them are just like listen right. she's just she's she had just, a crush on this dude when she was 10 yeah and then and then turned that into an imaginary song about like but what if we were together and that i'm i'm not knocking that like i don't think it, it just does make it feel like she has a lot of relationships because they can't right. all be this deep and meaningful and serious with every single one but and, and some of them never happened at all so and but that's also a, a move that makes sense if you're like trying to write a bunch of songs <laughs> i mean like, yeah that you would and you're trying to make them as compelling as possible you want them you you wouldn't write a song about like i dated this guy for a month and it was like whatever <laughs> <laughs> but she's never written a song about her cat well tech kind of i know karma includes a lyric about a cat but she ha she should write a song about her cat i i, I like actually agree with that our cat every day so well maybe I all the songs would. about healthy positive relationships are actually about her cat she'll say like oh this is about you know this guy but like it's actually about meredith gray those are also bad though they should be funnier <laughs> 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 I'm curious if you guys will indulge me because uh, we've got a lot of different opinions in terms of like, oh, I like Taylor Swift. I hate Taylor Swift. Oh, actually, I like this song. But, you know, like, oh, I actually like every song, you know, whatever, depending on who, who this is from. What would you guys give this album out of 10? Not as a Taylor Swift album, but just as a musical album. album. I'd probably give it a seven. That's much higher than me. I was going to say five out of ten. I would say like seven or eight. So I'm surprised yeah, I, Victor would go as high because I feel like I got more enjoyment than he did, but maybe not. Or maybe I, just I you think, as a musician are appreciating things about it. I, I think um, it, as I said at the beginning, it's about half good, but I think I take a song being good or generally positive as with more weight than I take a song being boring or negative, like okay. in opposite directions. So like if you have whatever we got here, like seven songs that are either good or I think positively of and seven that are, are bad or I think negatively of, I think of those seven good ones as being more like impactful than the yeah, best so, ones. So good songs benefit an album more than bad songs hurt an album, basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, okay. and I and maybe I think... maybe my model is a little bit flawed, but there's also the version of like if you're grading something, should you start at a hundred until they start making mistakes, or should you start at zero and add on as things are improved? Right. And yeah. I think I would go with that second one. Also, I think a lot of the time you'll find that one truly standout song justifies the existence of an album, right? Totally. Like we've all got we've all got albums that we just don't care about, but they've got one or two songs like that song is amazing and i'm glad that the rest of this trash exists just for the <laughs> sake of that song that said i would i would probably give this something in like the five range like if i were a time traveling reviewer who knew nothing about what would become of taylor swift's career i probably would have said something like you know 
you can hear the potential of her as a pop songwriter, but she hasn't really found a distinct voice for herself yet. And the actual album is sort of overwhelmed by the producer making generic choices. Yeah, I agree. Like, I, like yeah. I could picture her hearing this album. I could picture her coming out with a really good second album if she's got a bunch more songs that are of this caliber and she's able to work with better people. But uh, it could also go very badly. Yeah, I think that's kind of why this one boils down to a five for me. I know I've been very passionately in favor of a few of the songs here, um, but I do not think that they are good enough to outweigh the fact that the majority of this album feels like filler um, and that it's all pretty cliche. It's all pretty white bread to me. There's nothing again like she's not an artist you go to for really interesting and gripping arrangement or production or anything and clearly like the people she's working with are not interested in that either. I think it, it really does lead to something where it's like this is a very um, nice and cute debut for a teenager singer songwriter uh, and it has a lot of charm where it has charm and then the rest of it is pretty dull and I think even though I have like a lot of fond nostalgia with this particular record uh, when I look at it more objectively um, and just look at the choices that were made um, it's I think definitely just and and this is a problem I've run into with all of her records. I think they're too long. I think there's too much here. I think yeah. that she probably should have, and I think she did like release a high I'm Taylor Swift EP or something, but if you could just trim all the fat and just turn this into a really tight EP, I think it would be so much better. But she's constantly letting her herself down. And I, I know she doesn't feel this way because she makes a lot of money and like people love way more of her songs it seems good for her uh somehow to cast this broad of a net but i do think that it's just it just makes her albums not as fun to listen to because they are so bogged down with just stuff where i'm like you should have just cut this like it shouldn't be here um and this this one is a pretty significant um offender for me but should have said no is oh sorry go ahead Oh, I was going to say, but Should Have Said No is uh, better than A Hard Day's Night. The bass album of this one is, it is too long. I, I, I don't think, yeah, because <laughs> half of that is just not that, not that so good. I, I think here's I really, the, here's the trick. This is one that is you the don't shortest, like it. it's the least. So it's anything that you don't like is going to be too long. So if, I, if Steve has me listen to a 20 minute death metal EP, that's going to be too long for me because I just don't like it for people who like taylor swift they're excited about how many songs there are for mike and i who are kiss fans we like the kiss album hot in the shade because people say it's too long but like we like that there's extra songs in there we happen to enjoy all those songs so you don't her, even like boomerang one of I the best songs but, on the album but i like 14 other songs <laughs> on the album <laughs> <laughs> but what? oh wow fearless is 54 minutes long yeah, yeah. And yeah the thing i just is, think we we are doing the deluxe long. edition of fearless fearless Thank God. So well, we're, no, we are doing case, we are yeah. doing the deluxe version. But then when we do uh, fearless, some good bonus track on that one. But what what we're going to be doing because once you factor in the Taylor's versions where she adds even more songs, for the sake of the sanity of the panelists, what we're going to do is, if there were like deluxe editions with bonus tracks when the album first came out, we're going to do those. And then when we wrap around to doing the Taylor's versions, we're only going to rank the new songs for just the sake of the sanity okay. of everyone on the panel. So that we're still addressing Wait, everything, but not overloading it. So yeah, we'll eventually do we're eventually, Fearless. We're going to get back to the Smashing Pumpkins discography and do the 90-track version of Adore? Uh, <laughs> possibly. Um, but I know you got a hard out, Steve. So is there anything anybody wants to plug or any final statements? we got five minutes. You should come to MTAC, the Middle Tennessee Anime Convention in Nashville, Tennessee, next weekend, Easter weekend. It'll be neat. That's what I have to leave for is a meeting about that. And also listen to Break During the Fighters and Lipstick Generation. Uh, check out uh, James Game Boy on Bandcamp and all relevant streaming services if uh, the streaming service didn't kick you off of it like it did to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and uh, um, 
if I don't know exactly when it's going to come out, but watch uh, the movie Chicken Coop. I did the music for it. Yeah, we have both worked with that director. Um, so, yeah, definitely watch Chicken Coop. Um, Julia, feel free to plug your stuff. Okay. Um, you guys should check out Paramore and Radiohead. Uh, <laughs> those are my bands. No, if you like Taylor Swift, you should listen to Paramore and Radiohead instead. Um, if you are a Swifty and um, you want to tell me how bad my opinions are, uh, I'm actually really nice and will probably become lifelong friends. I'm at Lady Celery on all major platforms. Thank you. And Mike, anything you want to plug? Anything you want to say is a cool album you want people to listen to or anything like that? Yeah. People should check out uh, Brian Durbin's debut solo album, Only Jams, if you love uh, excellent hard rock music or uh, That's the a good song name. Should Have Said No. You might hear a song that... Uh, was unintentionally inspired by it. I received an honorary John Kaladner credit on the album. So uh, there's an album that I got to uh, pretty much hear from the ground up, and uh, it's excellent. That's a really good name of an album. Yeah, it was clever, yeah. All right, well, thank you uh, to all uh, five people who tuned in for the stream and for all the people watching later in the comments who will say angry things. I appreciate everybody, and I'm ending the stream now. Bye.